It's time. The quest has begun. Destiny has brought us here. Will you be joining me? I'm in. Prepare for epic reveals. What have you done, Witcher? Raise a toast to our special guests. Brilliant. Geralt's usually so stingy with the details. Welcome to WitcherCon. Hmm, when's howling? Hello everyone around the world and welcome to the first ever WitcherCon. My name's Julia Hardy and I'm going to be your host for today. And um, I was trying to summarise and, you know, put into words just what it means to me, you know, to be the host of today's events. But then I realised if I did put it into words, it would just be the sound that only a dog could hear. So yeah, I'm just going to try and keep my cool today, but it is going to be a little bit challenging, not going to lie. Over the next few hours, I'll be taking you on a whirlwind journey through the world of The Witcher, together with Netflix and CD Projekt Red. And I can promise you that there's going to be tons of sneak peeks, never before heard stories and special guests. Don't forget to share your favorite moments with us throughout the show though, using the hashtag WitcherCon. <sighs> Let's just get started. I think that's what we need to do, right? So we wouldn't be here without Andrzej Sapkowski, who obviously created the beloved Witcher world. Now, sadly, he can't join us in the studio today, but he did send us this personal message. So he says, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all Witcher enthusiasts, fans of the books, the TV series and the video games to the virtual WitcherCon convention. I'm sure that we'll all have grand fun and when these challenging times are finally over, we'll meet again at WitcherCon, which is kind of really sweet. Oh, well, without further ado, let's get started. Kicking us off is our house band, the amazing Marcin Pibivovich and Percival, who you might know as the musical masterminds responsible for the Witcher game soundtracks. Take it away, guys. Set, it's time to tee up our first panel here at WitcherCon and in true Witcher fashion we are letting Destiny take the lead in this cast Q&A with a little bit of a twist. But before we dive into the deck let me introduce our wonderful panelists. So joining the cast this season in the role of Lambert, a Witcher not to be messed with, here's Paul Bullion. How are you doing Paul? Hi, I'm very good thank you. It's yeah? gonna be fun, looking forward to this. I feel like I need to shout a bit over there. Hey, how's it <laughs> <Hey>. going? <laughs> We can't wait to see what this enigmatic Nilfgaardian mage has in store for us in season two. Fringilla herself, Mimi M. Kayser. Hello. Mimi, how are you doing? <laughs> it's really good to be here. I'm slightly intimidated, actually. Why? I don't know. Just... Don't be intimidated, but chill. Look at my fan. Look at that. Casual. <laughs> Casual mischief, love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a powerful sorceress, defender of the Northern Kingdoms and beloved by Geralt. Here's our Yennefer of Engenberg, Anya Chalatra. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? I yeah, do feel good. I do feel like that we should give her a clap because we all know Jennifer loves a good clap. Yeah, I do. Uh, inappropriate oh, moment. I was waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what's going to happen to you for like the end of time? Just be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope so. 
<laughs> Princess of Sintra, child of surprise, and now newest witcher in training, it's our Siri, Freya Allen. Hey, Freya. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Good to have you here. This is great. We've got, got everyone. But wait, there's one more person we need to introduce. And finally, the woman at the heart of Netflix is The Witcher, showrunner and executive producer, Lauren Schmidt. His rig. How you doing, Lauren? <laughs> I'm good. I'm great. I'm really nervous. This is not this is not what I normally do as a writer. <laughs> no, it's just, we're just having a bit of a chat. I know that there's yeah. like all these cameras here, but you know, just having a bit of chat. I'm a bit <laughs> of a nerd. It's fine. Don't worry. Great. Okay. Great. It's all good. Um, I think we should see what the cards have in store for us. So welcome to the deck of destiny. Oh. I was told to <laughs> shuffle them, but I'm wearing like nails today, and this is really problematic. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> So basically, instead of kind of running through, uh, you know, a list of kind of generic questions uh, to our esteemed guests, I'm going to be choosing fan questions from random from the deck of destiny. So the contents of this deck are as much a mystery to me as they are to you, but the cards are going to reveal a, a surprise or two, I think. So let's do the first card. Right, hold on, let me get this the right way around. Come on. Okay, right, the first card. Okay. So this fan is uh, clearly hungry for a little bit of a season two scoop. Uh, so Lauren, actually, why don't you take this one? Um, how did you approach the relationship between Geralt and the other witches at Care Morn? Because, you know, it's like the homestead, you know, what's going on? It is the homestead. You know, so much of what we talk about in The Witcher is about family. And so that's where we started this relationship with. Um, Henry had um, Henry Cavill. Maybe you've heard of him. Um, I mean, don't think we need to use surnames <laughs> at this point, honestly. Um, you know, Henry actually comes from a family of brothers. So it's something that we talked about a lot and what it is like to be part of a big family. He also comes from a military family. So we talked a lot about the Witchers being almost like a military family. They all go out, they sort of do, um, they have their own adventures. It's really dangerous. You never know if your brothers are going to come back home or not. But when they do, when they reunite every single winter, um, that's when they get to relax and just be themselves. So one of the, the most fun things that we did, and Paul can speak to this a little bit too, <laughs> is just to make sure that they feel like, you know, like actual brothers. They roughhouse a lot. They give each other a lot of <laughs> Am I allowed to say first words? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, amazing. So no, they're constantly teasing each other. We just want to make sure that it felt, when they come together, light and fun, like real brothers would be. Excited about okay. <laughs> um, okay, so um, Paul, what was it like to um, yeah to be kind of involved in that, to kind of be brought into Care Morn and in that sort of Witcher, you know, thrown in in uh, season two? It was quite surreal because um, I, I actually watched season one uh, when it was released, knowing that I was going to be joining Ooh, in, se in season weird. two, which was uh, which was strange but exciting. And uh, so to step into Care Morn in, in season two and brought into the fold in that way, everyone was really welcoming and and, and like Lauren uh, touched on there. Henry uh, brought me into the conversation about how uh, the witches were like a band of Navy SEALs. And uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he would say, yeah, he would. He would Did he you would... bond? Do you have a bromance with Henry? Well, well, uh, he he created an environment where we we could you know have that on set where we would we would uh, we would laugh and we would make jokes and it all fed into into the scenes really well. Uh -huh. And it was the idea that you know we we would die for each other. We are we are family through shared experiences. That's um, super so, adorable. Yeah. I'm super into it. It was good fun. <laughs> okay, say, on the back of that. Yeah. So we weren't in any scenes together. Yeah. But I would normally be in the morning after all the guys had been in. Did it have a certain <laughs> muscle? You would get in the air. stories of what <laughs> <laughs> And it was so it was really fun for me because I was like the only girl amongst these guys. And it was just it was hysterical. <laughs> like getting to getting to be with you guys all day. It was great. It was, it was quite funny. And, and from okay. walking on set and, I, and Freya would always have this look because you know she you knew she was gonna be uh, like like teasing and, yeah. and joining in with the fun and I'd, I'd walk in and I'd see I could just feel Freya looking I'd look over I'd go here we go <laughs> <laughs> we've got a full day I mean, of this our, our, like how we are in real life is just like our characters I'm, I'm mm. fully getting that vibe um, actually <laughs> I'm fully getting yeah. that vibe I'm taking taking yeah. out of them <laughs> no we um, love that yeah love a bit of that fun. okay so this one is for Anya this one's for you okay so, uh, which monster would you most like to kiss? No, I'm just kidding. That's not really the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is the one trait? <laughs> Sorry. Which is the one trait about your character's personality that you kind of absolutely love? Um, <clears throat> I'd have to say, where there's a will, there's a way. With her, she is a survivor, and I love that about her. That would be my favourite. Yeah. There's lots. There's, there's many traits I love. We've we've become quite similar, I think. 
Yeah. <laughs> we uh, inform each other, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Right, okay. Do the actors keep character notebooks? And if so, what kind of independent exercises and explorations uh, do you do to kind of refine your characters? I think... So it might not be a physical book that we keep, a log or journey, but we do definitely always check in with each other in terms of where we are. Um, and I do this thing a lot where, as an actor, I want to show my range and, like, you know, be like, do all these things. But actually to check in with each other and say, OK, we're not at that point of the story yet. We can fully immerse ourselves in what the truth is of that. And so I think a lot of us are very conscious of constantly checking in with each other to, to say, well, we're here in this relationship or... Um, and even working with Eamon sometimes, you'll do a scene, he'll be like, I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's an next Of course he does. <laughs> not there yet. <laughs> so he really does. does. <laughs> I love it. No. And I'm like, I was the only one in that scene. What do you mean we're not there yet? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> oh, amazing. OK, so, we yeah. have another question now on the deck of destiny. Um, OK, so... <laughs> We've actually kind of struck gold here because this is actually a Gwent card from, you know, the Witcher card uh, game. So we can actually take a look here. We can see our Sunset Wanderers there. Look at that. Delightful. So um, this one, uh, I believe it's for, it's, it's for Paul. Can you give us a sneak peek of a monster from uh, season two? Just one little one, please. Well, we weren't really meant to be giving away any, any little sneak peeks, but... What? Why am I here? As, seeing as we've waited so long because of... Uh, because of the world stopping, I think it's only fair that we give the first little sneak peek of one of the first monsters in season two. It's the Leshy. Oof. Let's take a look. Your teasers, it's ridiculous. It's a bit of a hand or something. Yeah. What? No, I saw a meme though. I was expecting like. <laughs> anyway, I'm not gonna. Not yet. Spoil. I was about to spoil. <laughs> it must be really difficult not to spoil things. I'll be like, bleh. Um, um, so, okay, this one's for you, Freya. Um, let me just turn over the card. Let's move along. Okay, so um, in the first season, this is obviously a fan question. In the first season, obviously, we kind of got glimpses of kind of Siri's power, mm -hmm. uh, you know, her power. But are we going to see like a whole load of it in uh, season two? Or is it a bit more kind of like drip fed, do you think, over the course of the season? Or is it just going to go all in? Because, you know. Um, I mean, for Siri, her, whatever she possesses inside her is a very scary thing for her and so she's not she's not keen to start kind of confronting it but i think you you know you see that as time goes on and she's introduced to the right people she realizes that actually it's far more beneficial to try and control whatever this is that she has um, than run away from it yeah which is what she's been doing for a lot of the time um, but yeah you know you're definitely going to get to see a lot of series potential in many different ways. Yeah, I think actually also, I just want to draw attention to, um, obviously we've got some amazing fan art that's kind of happening behind. So if you actually take a look at this one, this is all the way from um, Hungary. I mean, I have to say as actors, how often, like, I mean, you don't get drawn when you do other shows or whatever, do you know what I mean? Like, it must be really fun to like kind of see all this art. There's some amazing artwork, wow, yeah. And even just seeing that, like, just yeah. a reminder, there's, there's so much as well, yeah. yeah. It's just amazing to see how many people are inspired and specifically what characters they're inspired by. Yeah. You know, it is, obviously the show is called The Witcher, um, but it's been fun as the person who sits back and has sort of been mm. having these characters in my mind for so long to see how different people all over the world yeah. relate to, you know, all of these characters. Mm. And I, I've never known so much anticipation around something that they haven't seen yet. So like, they haven't seen, they haven't seen Lambert yet. But we know Lambert already, though. Yeah. And we've been wanting to see him. And, it, and, it's, and it's very strange as an actor to have uh, images uh, drawn of your character before they, well, they've even seen. Mm. And, it's, and it's very flattering as well, but it, it's just, it just shows how much love for the show there is yeah. out there. There is a lot of love. Do they capture your hair well <laughs> they, enough? They, I think, yeah, I think their, their hair would have its own, own gallery, I think. <laughs> um, and we, 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 own, we, we owe that... that the look, I suppose, to, to the, the the pause, 
I just didn't cut my hair because I couldn't. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was it was um, it was interesting when when the, the the head of hair and makeup just said, "Don't touch a thing, mm -hmm. just come in." Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, nice. So yeah, call it the uh, the COVID look. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know there's like clearly like so much to look forward to um, in season two, but I think um, the next one's going to be for you, Anya. Let's uh, turn a card. Right. Okay. So um, before we kind of get into this, actually, I just wanted to point out there are some beautiful. Look at these Gwent wow. cards here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Yennefer, you know, kind of being an absolute badass as usual. Actually, and Siri as well. It's amazing. So, um, yeah, what was the most exciting thing about, you know, portraying Siri and, and Yennefer's relationship? Because now we're kind of getting to the meat of it. It's good. I'm excited. Well, we've never worked together. So we're so close, but we've never, we've never acted together. Yeah. Which was bizarre. Because um, we knew each other so well, because we went through the whole of the first season together. We were living, you know, so close to each mm -hmm. other. Um, so the most exciting thing for me was just getting to know what it's like to work with Freya and that and see what that dynamic was and then that was informs it, it our right? relationship. Sorry? <laughs> was it all right? I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was amazing. She's amazing and you know her character goes on such a journey like from what I saw in season one to you know get to work with her at a point in this season which is completely different um, is, you know, is a joy. Oh, it's so, like, it's so adorable and wholesome. I love it. Um, next card, I think. Sorry. Right, here we go. Uh, so, uh, Mimi, um, let's take a look at this frown art of uh, Frangilla. It's really poetic. Look at it. It's called The Mist. Oh, um, so I think this next question is for you. So, um, yeah, what was the most challenging part about playing your character in uh, the second series? Now that you know kind of more about her. Yeah, I mean... I love her. I absolutely love her. We call her Fringy for short. <laughs> um, and that's when we're feeling really endearing towards her. I would genuinely have days where I would read the scripts of things that she does sometimes and my heart would break for her. Because I think there is a thing when you're an actor playing a character, you just, you fall in love with them. And everything they do, even the worst things, you completely sympathize mm. and want to cover them and be like, it's okay, we're going to yeah. get through that awful thing you did. Right. Well, I suppose you sort of have to, right, to understand the character, you have to understand yeah. the motivation. Yeah, and also like the pain that you must be in to do that. And I'd be like, oh my God, put the sword down. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you, become like, you become like a best friend to your character. You and anyone who messes with them, you're like, um, Excuse me. No. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't, don't talk, don't talk about it. them like it's that. So true. <laughs> and your character's allies as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if an ally is not there, you're like, you better hold on. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand them and <laughs> <laughs> I've looked into their soul. Yeah. It's true, you get so territorial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so sometimes it will come to do scenes and I'll be like, oh, why is she got to do that? Yeah. <laughs> and then it and, comes from the human element in the mm, show as well. Mm, every character yeah. has, you know, every. There's, in the real world, everyone's represented by somebody in the show, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I've definitely had moments in my life where I think, that wasn't a good decision. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. have to live don't with we it, all? don't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. about that arc. Um, mm. And also, like, completely trusting that journey and trusting that you don't need to know how it's resolved now. Yes. Yeah. Um, that was something that I kept having to remind myself of, thinking, we haven't seen that side or we haven't been there yet, and just trusting that right here, right now, is really important for where she's going to go, wherever mm, that may mm, be. Mm, yeah. um, that was really great, you know, when you're doing a sort of longer journey with somebody. Oh, yeah. Amazing. OK, so uh, this question, I think, seems like a good one for Freya. This one's for you. Um, so are we going to see any training sequences this season, are we? Because, you know, you're not just suddenly a witcher and then you're amazing. There's a lot of hard work involved. There's a lot of hard work that's involved. Um, yes, you are. Um, <laughs> it's... It's, it was one of my, the things I was most excited about for season two um, because I love doing all that. I love the stunt department. We have the best um, people involved with that and they're so much fun and like get the best out of you. Um, but yeah, no, Siri, Siri begins training and that actually becomes one of her main kind of drives. Um, she, she's very determined and she really wants to become like a great fighter and become a witcher. Um, and it's hard because she's got certain 
brotherly figures around <laughs> who were a little bit annoying. And don't, That's every you know, brother, I think, in the whole yeah, world. Yeah, and, there, and um, Geralt's being a little bit, you know, not quite letting her reach the potential she wants to, which is very frustrating for her. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, um, we actually have a funny story, me and Paul. <laughs> <laughs> because there was this one, we do this one scene and um, Lambert comes in and he he um, is meant to slice this uh, dummy. Oh, you're going with that one? With yeah, that yeah, story. yeah, okay. he's meant to slice this dummy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> each time he was just missing. <laughs> and I tried to hold it together in the scene, but I just couldn't stop but help but burst into laughter because every time it was just failing. We were trying to continue on with the scene, but it just... It and just when, wasn't. When I, when I do finally <laughs> in half, okay. Frey is very aware that the camera is over her shoulder and they're not getting her reaction. <laughs> so I look up to just Frey. Frey is, Frey is trying not to make eye contact with me <laughs> because she's laughing, and I'm meant to be stern. And I'm just looking at Freya laughing, and and, and then I was went, literally just like this. I was like. <laughs> and, as, and, as, and, then, and then they shout, cut, and she goes, finally. <laughs> <laughs> this is great, although difficult, I presume, for acting when someone's totally... Oh, it, was, it, was, you know, it, was a, it really was a, a joy, really. We had a lot of fun yeah. during yeah. that sequence. And we're yeah. very competitive uh, in a fun way, offset anyway. I mean, yeah, I've and then done... it came to a scene where I had to chop the head off of one, and the AD goes... Yep you better beat Paul. <laughs> and I literally do first take and the head goes flying off. And I'm Amazing. Like, yes. Yes. Can't wait to tell one. Paul. <laughs> I think we've actually got a picture of you guys trading. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's have a look. I mean, look, not, look at that. Is that was that Lamba, after that particular scene you were talking about where you like yeah, yeah, laughing in your face? This You're like, it. thanks. <laughs> Ruined my day of acting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, was, uh, no, it was good fun. Oh. I mean, Paul, how was the weapons training? How did you enjoy it? No, I really, I really enjoyed it. I mean, as a as a kid, I, I think one of my first memories, I was about two or three, and a local pound shop, they had those plastic swords, you know, um, they used to fall apart after like a day. Yeah. But I used to always get one when I was in that pound shop, and I used to pretend that I was running, you know, running around my garden into the bushes, like... You're living but, your childhood li fantasy yeah, right now. now it's like a profession. You get paid for it. <laughs> yeah. Someone's giving you money yeah. to live out your childhood dream. 30 years later, Life suddenly came together. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. No, no, it was, uh, yeah, great fun. And uh, you know, like 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 Freya, Freya touched on there, the stunt department, the fire choreography. You know, it's it's top, and uh, and it's a great atmosphere when you go into the stunt rehearsal because it's a, lo a load of big kids that love doing what they do, and you <laughs> yeah. get and you get to go in there and have fun. Yeah. yeah right. So I guess we should ask probably Lauren. You've been sitting here, throwing anything to you for a little while. So I think I might. You're all right. You're just enjoying it. Like whatever. It's totally fine. Um, so we've got a lot of new characters um, announced for season two, and obviously, you know, yourself as a big fan of the original material. Um, which one are you most excited to see? Are you allowed to have a favourite though? Because maybe you're not. I, I don't know say, how that works. That's like asking me my favourite child. That's really hard. I mean, but everyone has one. They deny it, but they do. <laughs> Okay, I have one. Um, <laughs> a favorite child? <laughs> no, don't tell my sons. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, there are so many characters that we're introducing. We are getting to see Dijkstra for the first time in sort of the Redanian kingdoms. Um, I know a lot of fans are excited to meet Philippa for the first time. Codringer and Fenn, Rience, um, Nenica. There's, I mean, so many. But I would have to say um, Vesemir is the one I'm looking most mm -hmm. forward to our audience meeting. Um, you know, Vesemir is so integral to the story that we're telling this season. Obviously, we're returning to Kaer Morhen for the first time. And in a season that is about Geralt becoming a father to Ciri, mm -hmm. it felt so important to meet who his father figure was. And you end up with this multi-generational story because Vesemir and, and Ciri have a story as well. And it does start to feel like, oh, all of these people are meant to be interacting and learning from each other and fighting with each other. I mean, it doesn't doesn't all go well all the time. <laughs> no, <laughs> family does. Um, but it's, uh, and, and Kim Bodnia, who plays Vesemir, is... Sorry, the casting on that, I just have to small aside. Oh my God, perfection. So perfection. Good. So good. <laughs> like, you're like, son, you're like, obviously yeah. it's him. Obviously. I mean, who else could it be? Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I just today was watching an episode and it's a scene that we actually were kind of struggling with. Um, it was a scene that took an entire day to shoot um, and it was just, um, Vesemir and Ciri in, uh, in a Caramoran lab. 
and we were struggling with it so much because it's such an emotional scene and so much happens. And I have to say, probably my favorite scene of the season. It is so beautifully acted and glorious, and I cry and I see it a lot. So, so I, I sort of want to know more, but I don't want to know more because it's just making it harder. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to lie. Um, I do feel like the deck of uh, Destiny hasn't disappointed, and I don't want to kind of push uh, like our luck a little bit. But to be honest with you, I just want to keep asking you guys questions if that's all right. So I think we'll go for another round. Ooh. So um, all right. Oh, okay, well, this isn't useful. There's like a J here, and I don't know if that's like a joker. Is it a joke? <laughs> oh, no, it's going to be, ah, uh, okay, all right. Yeah, it's Yaskia. There he is. There he is. Oh, Look at him, yeah. his little sweet face. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that um, Joey can actually join us right now. Hey, gang. Uh, my name is Joey. I play Yaskia in The Witcher, which uh, I, I, I assume you knew because you're all here and you're all... Massive nerds. I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person uh, today. I'm actually working on another project, hence the, the beard. Um, but I'm here to answer some of your questions that have been forwarded onto me and, um, and, and also give you a little sneak peek, a little surprise at the end. Uh, this is from Sally. Hi, Sally. Um, dear Joey, oh my God, you're amazing. And there is no question who vetted these i feel uh, this one is from from john um uh hi john uh dear joey will there be a hat in season two gotta let the hat thing go guys <laughs> it's getting weird now that being said there might be a small amount of hat uh in it for about 47 seconds Finally, uh, we've got one. Oh, this is a lovely one. It's got lots of uh, lots of stickers on it. It's got a bit of crayon. Hi, Joey. Hi. Uh, is it is it a burden playing someone as talented and funny and brilliant and talented as Yaskia? No, and that's from Henry Cab. Henry. <laughs> Henry, did you send, you know what, I'm just gonna ignore this and the drawings that you've done. There's two <laughs> little stick figures there. And underneath it says, best friends. I'm just gonna, just gonna ignore that. Finally, uh, hopefully you've been uh, waiting for this for a while, I know, but hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little sneak preview of, uh, of Yaskia's new look. In season two, he's gone a bit more rock and roll. I think uh, I think it's it's definitely something. Um, let's bring it up so everyone can see. And uh, there he is. What a <laughs> <laughs> what a moron! What's he doing? That was actually taken. Uh, that's just a photo of me from my uh, pub, local pub. You you can tell because everyone around me is. Um, Incredibly bored. I hope you enjoyed that uh, little sneak preview. Um, I cannot wait to share this uh, this season with you later in the year. But until then, I'm uh, just going to go and uh, burn burn this. Lots of love, everyone. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, much like his character, Joey certainly knows how to leave his audience entertained. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but seeing season two, Yaskia, made me even more kind of like curious. So I feel like Deck of Destiny, we definitely need to turn to you once more and uh, show me what you got. All right. OK. Right. You ready? So this one says, which scene or sequence was the most fun to film? I think, Paul, why didn't you take this one? OK. Um, I have to say... Probably the training sequence with Freya, uh, Lambert, uh, Cohen, and Siri. Um, I remember it took, it took a couple of weeks. It was quite a hot summer's, summer, summertime, um, and uh, we had all the fake snow everywhere, and it was, it was quite strange to have that, that combination to, to be cold in the boiling hot. Um, and it was just so much fun. I think that was a real camaraderie starting to kick in. So it was quite near the, the start of the shoot, I think. And um, again, in the, the, the spirit of competition, I made a passing comment 
about how much I like sour sweets. And Freya <laughs> said, I bet I can eat more than you. So I, I took that as a this. challenge. So I'm online trying to find the most sour sweets like I can find. <laughs> I bring them to set the next day and uh, cut to, uh, to, to Freya with so many sour sweets. Uh, Yas, who plays Cohen, his eyes are streaming. <laughs> I'm coughing. She wins. <laughs> Yeah. Really? I haven't even eaten sugar in so long as well, and we'd force it down. And yeah. I literally, my cheeks look like a... Um, bulging. Yeah, but <laughs> the, the most important thing is that you won, though. It, yes. Yeah. But she did yes. have to go to set with a blue tongue, so I wasn't very popular <laughs> yeah. with the makeup department. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, it sounds like a blooming holiday camp, this. It's great. I'm, I'm fully into it. OK, uh, next question. Right, OK, so uh, here's a kind of fun one for you. So um, show Witcher fans a collectible figure. So I believe, actually, this is... Uh, Anya, one for you. You're going to... Introduce this one. So, Dark Horse produced high-end figures that are coming out at the end of this year. But we have a teaser for you now, <gasps> I think, I believe. <gasps> Ponderous. <laughs> and if you stay tuned, you'll be able to see any of us. <gasps> Ooh, yeah. And so um, I believe the pre-sale date is uh, 23rd of July for that. So mark that in, uh, in your diaries there. Look at that. Pensive. Amazing. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, like right. This. One final card for you guys from the deck of Destiny. So uh, let's make it count. So the card is asking us uh, to reveal your favourite photo of Siri and Geralt. And uh, actually, I'm a little bit ahead, I think, of you guys here, as I um, have a, 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 a little surprise for you. Um, Netflix, uh, can you reveal my new favourite photo, actually? Boom. Aww. Wow. Look at that. That's amazing. But I think more importantly, I think, for everyone is uh, yeah, that those other a, words at the bottom there. There's a date oh, listed here. Yeah. Oh, my god! Look at that. <laughs> I didn't even know. <laughs> didn't you know? <laughs> this is a surprise to everyone here. <laughs> December 17th, we are doing The Witcher amazing. Season 2. You've made our Christmas. Look at that. That's it. Brilliant. <laughs> Witcher Christmas. We have an answer oh, for people goodness. now. <laughs> yes, we finally can answer yeah. people when they ask us. Yeah, I know. That's amazing. Oh. I mean, Lauren, obviously, you know, it, I want to know everything about season two, but I mean, don't spoil anything, but can you tell me more about, you know, Siri and Geralt's journey? But without spoiling anything, but can you tell me everything, but without spoiling anything? Without spoiling anything, but tell you everything that yeah. we've done. Yes, yeah. of course. Um, <laughs> no, you know, obviously at the end of season one, we have what I think is one of the sort of most emotional scenes that we've done, which is Geralt and Siri finding each other after they've both been searching all season. And we get this super emotional hug between them. And it seems like, you know, we've got father figure and daughter figure and everything's going to be perfect at that point. Um, except for they've never met. <laughs> and so it was really fun to start season two thinking about, well, they're not a family yet. How do they grow to be one? What do you do if you are a person um, like Geralt is, who has sworn he doesn't need anyone in the world whatsoever? Um, and then he's presented with a girl who's now solely in his care. And we have uh, Siri who's used to being under the care of people, but now has basically been running from everyone for an entire season mm -hmm. and now, now being told that, you know, this person is going to take care of you. And so it was really fun to start season two uh, kind of with them a little uncertain about mm -hmm. how to be with each other. Yeah. And they have to really grow into that. We wanted to make sure that felt like an authentic relationship, that because they weren't just bonded at the very beginning. Yeah, and it's it's the, the reality of the situation is Siri has, has a lot, like, struggles to trust people after her journey to Geralt. And so um, it's not easy for her to just open up. And also she's got a lot of things that she doesn't want to open up about. And so it's kind of that dynamic of Geralt trying to understand this girl and she's resisting it a little bit. Um, but Geralt's not always going about it the right way. And it's that kind of, sometimes they're knocking heads, but eventually they do become, you see them become a team. And that's when it's like so lovely. And there's a scene at the end of um, ep episode one that's probably one of my favorite scenes that we shot, um, which is like, you, you just, you see a glimmer of what their relationship could become and the trust that could be bef could be forming between the two of them, which I think is beautiful. Yeah, that's such an amazing scene. And it's it sticks out in my brain um, because as an American, I use the word okay a lot. That's, yeah. how, that's how we respond to things. <laughs> and it was Freya who was like, you should know that Brits don't really say okay, we say all right. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> like it, it's probably in the script a hundred times, like, <laughs> okay. And it's the final word of that scene. And it is oddly so powerful because it is an acceptance of the two of them having to start to trust each other and it's just, just 
Getting a bit emotional. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. All these things. No, it's going to be amazing. So excited. Oh, it's ever the fine line between knowing everything and not knowing anything, but then being surprised, but also knowing everything. Mm -hmm. It's December tricky. December 17th now. now exactly. You know. you I can plan my diary so. around that. <laughs> um, so I should obviously say, uh, later in the show, of course, we're going to be having a chat with the man himself, Geralt. Henry is going to be uh, having a chat. Not that I'm salty that he's not here right now or anything. Um, but we, I think it's all the time we have for with the deck of Destiny. So I just want to say a massive thank you to all of our panellists. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really, really enjoyable. And I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the panel. And thanks so much for all your questions, all you guys back at home. Um, but do stay tuned because there's so much more Witcher business brewing. And we're moving straight from one card game into another. And if you're wondering what on earth we were talking about, you know, when we mentioned Gwent, the Witcher card game earlier, then stick around for a short explainer coming right up. Set in a dark and twisted world full of witchers, monsters, knights, and sorceresses, Gwent is a card game where armies clash and you, as commander, lead the charge. You engage in battles divided into rounds. To win a round, you need to gain more points than your opponent. To win a battle, you need to claim victory in two out of three rounds. Sound easy? Trust me, it won't be. Behold your favorite characters, beautifully drawn and animated. Outsmart your opponents on the battlefield and expand your collection of cards just by play. Powerful armies and mighty commanders, tough choices and brutal consequences. <laughs> this is the world of the Witcher and it's at your fingertips. So see you on the battlefield. I mean, note to self, obviously get myself some Gwent cards, but also note to panel, I desperately need more information about season two. I mean, you can't leave us hanging like this after that last reveal. <sighs> no, look, Freya, okay, come on, Freya. You've got, you've got some juicy got. What, what can you give me, please? Just a I think I can help you out there. As you know, Siri's going through some pretty serious life changes next season, but the magic and drama aren't just unfolding on screen. Join me as we take a little peek behind the scenes. very happy with season one because it was so well received and so many people contacted me telling me how much they loved it so you know I was just over the moon. I was thrown into season one I was very new to it all and really had to just learn on the on the job. We were nervous because obviously we loved it because we put blood sweat and tears into it but um, I'm so glad the audience loved it as well. I actually do have a lot of lovely memories from season one. I remember I just loved shooting episode one after her. I'm literally just running through the woods constantly. Always <laughs> just running away from everyone. And I feel like this season you really see her grow. I have favourite scenes from season one, but I loved my whole journey with Yennefer. <sighs> this season, everyone worked their ass off to, to, put, to make this happen. And so I'm just excited for people to see everyone's hard work. I mean, that's what we do it for. We do it for the fans, and the fact that gaming fans loved it as well as the new fans that were coming on board was just brilliant. Can't wait, actually, for people to see this season. When it comes to the Witcher series, extraordinary talent isn't just on screen, it's behind the scenes too. In this instalment of the Humans of the Continent series, Netflix's master armorer Nick Jeffries shows us just what goes into making the weapons of the continent. Have a look for yourself.
Hi, I'm Nick Jeffries. I'm the master armorer for The Witcher. I design the weapons for The Witcher. I'm also in charge of the armory department. This is a medieval dagger. It does exactly what it says on the tin. And it also has the ears at the top, which allow you to put a thumb on it for a very powerful strike. So here we have Yarpen's hammer. Name's Yarpen Zikarin. This was a, a Nilfgaard sentry who unfortunately was a little bit rude to Yarpen, so he cut his wrist off and then he cast it in bronze. <laughs> If you had to pick, which monster would you fight and which of your weapons would you use? I'd fight the smallest monster and I'd shoot it straight between the eyes with a Colt 45. What type of monster would I fight? <laughs>
But then over and over kind of the question came, you know, the game is called the Witcher. Everyone who loves the books really they likes... know who The Witcher is, right? Exactly, it's Geralt of <laughs> Rivia. Everyone wants yeah. to play as The Witcher. So, you know, at some point, I think everyone kind of realized, yeah, we want to be Geralt of Rivia, we want to be The Witcher, and then we basically continued uh, the story and we made up our own, you know, continuation of whatever happens and introduced back all of these characters that people actually grew to love. All right, so we already talked a little bit about how we started, you know, when we decided to make Geralt of Rivia, but maybe let's go even further back to the start. How do we even start, you know, thinking about these stories that we then turn into video games? Yeah, so, well, obviously you start by reading the books and, you know, getting to know the lore, etc., etc. but it's deeper than that, because we have to go to the uh, inspiration for our own inspiration, which means to all the stuff that inspired uh, the author of the, of the series. Uh, and this is also inspiring for us, um, and we use it to uh, build our worlds um, in, in the game, right? So it's kind of like a um, postmodern deconstruction almost mm -hmm. of uh, fairy tales and, uh, and uh, all the Slavic mythology that we use. Or for the case of Beauclair, we also use, uh, uh, sorry for my French, Chanson de Geste <laughs> uh, of, uh, of uh, Roman mythology. Uh, so f for us, we use all of that uh, as inspiration and uh, the deconstruction come come fr comes from the fact that we put real people like you and I into mm -hmm. that fantasy wor world filled with elves and monsters and or uh, and, and, and all that stuff. I was trying to say chimeras, uh, but I said <laughs> orcs, whatever. No, There's no, no orcs, orcs in the Witcher, <laughs> Witcher, in the Witcher world. Uh, I wanted to say chimeras. Anyway, uh, the all of that is also interesting on the meta level because uh, we the, the way this world actually works like in the lore is uh, it has real people from our world like our physical world in the fantasy world uh, this all happened in an event that is called the conjunction of the spheres where two planets aligned and the people from our world were transported into the uh, into the fantasy world that uh, Geralt lives in. So it's interesting on a meta level because the, the, the inspirations are actually um, kind of made manifest in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, also these inspirations are kind of important when it comes to the kind of themes and like general topics we want to explore. Mm -hmm. So often essentially when we come up with quests, we often look at, you know, let's say, the world that Geralt moves around in. So as an example, in The Witcher Wild Hunt, uh, Geralt explores Velen, which is a part of Redania. And in this time, it's war-torn. So of course, we want to tell lots of stories that have to do with these topics. Mm -hmm. So we basically, when we come up with quests, we think, you know, what themes are interesting for us to explore? What interests us and then what interests, as an example, the mm -hmm. audience? So for sure, as an example, if we would tell stories about a war-torn land. As an example, I as a quest designer would say, I think I have an idea. I want to make a story about, let's say, civilian suffering mm -hmm. in this world. And then we essentially start doing our research because we essentially always say we're making mature games. We tell mature stories. And it doesn't mean that it has to have, you know, gore and violence and sex. Of course, you know, that can always be part of it. But what it actually means is that we really want to tell about topics that we think are important, that are interested to us, and that essentially make people, you know, think when they play and that make them feel mm -hmm. when they play and that are, you know, maybe sometimes a little bit challenging. So this is often for us actually the first thing to start, essentially to really go. We don't just want to tell stories of, you know, a witcher walking around the land and slaying monsters, because that's not what we want to do, that's not what Sapkowski did, but really to say what is actually an interesting theme that you know, is worth exploring. And that's basically our rule for almost every single quest, where we just ask, why does that story need to be told? And if you know, we can answer all of these questions, then we usually have a good start for a quest. Yes. But there's also a technical challenge to that, right? Because um, the you just said war turn land, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this puts a mental picture in my mind that uh, kind of fills in the details. And I, and I, and I have this, this picture um, 100 percent rendered in my head. Now the thing is, in a game where we want to immerse you, we actually have to do all that work. We as a team, not we as quest designers, but the whole studio has to work on rendering this uh, war-torn land 
um, in in painstaking detail, pretty much, because uh, it's uh, it's environment artists, it's effects artists, it's level designers, it's all that stuff that we need to actually physically create in the game, so that it looks like a uh, like a water on land. So all the all the details that uh, in a book you can kind of uh, fill in with an offhand uh, sentence, we do have to render to make it immersive, right? So there's this technical thing. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, we also have to do it in a realistic way, because we're always saying we don't want to make a stage on which our stories take place. We actually want to create a world. And essentially, if you're supposed to be immersed in these worlds, you're also supposed to feel that it's mm. real. Uh, so I can just give one example. In The Witcher Wild Hunt, you're exploring the city of Novigrad, which, you know, fans of the books might already know and love. And we basically had to do tons and tons of research, you know, our concepts teams, our environment art teams, to really see that the city shouldn't just look like any medieval city, mm -hmm. but also it needs to function. You know, the city is a big merchant city, so it needs a really big harbor. It, as an example, has a very famous harbor crane, mm -hmm. and it needs, you know, proper walls around it with lots of, uh, lots of different gates, because Novigrad is a free city in the state of Redenia, so of course it needs lots of defense. And then we also, you know, had to think about how do these people feed themselves? Of course, they do have a harbor. The, the what do they eat question. Exactly, right? what do they eat? So <laughs> the actually... Basic question when you world build, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, like, it's not just that, yeah, there's a city and now there's forests full of monsters. No, actually, it's mm -hmm. a big medieval city. So of course it is surrounded by, you know, lands of fields that live different weeds grow there. And then of course, you know, we actually had people checking what kind of weeds would they grow in different parts of the world? Because of course, you mm -hmm. know, the temperature yeah. matters yeah. and all yeah, of yeah. these details. <laughs> because the thing is, we don't necessarily have to tell you oh, all of this thing is there, you know, the infrastructure, so the world works. But if they are not there, you just notice that it's missing. You just mm -hmm. feel like I'm walking around some artificial world, but what you're supposed to feel like that you are Geralt of Rivia living in the world yeah, of the yeah. Witcher. You, you take all of that subconsciously, you take it all in subconsciously, and then by just way of being there, it gives a much bigger gravitas and depth to all the stories that we tell because they happen in, a, in your mind, real world, right? As a player. Yeah, exactly. So that's... That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we talked about what kind of things inspire us when we start to come up with stories. But now let's also maybe just quickly give people a glimpse on all the challenges we actually face in making these stories into video games. Mm -hmm. So uh, one challenge that might be not that obvious, uh, but it is the first thing that comes to my mind, uh, is the point of view that the player has in the game. Uh, because in a game you're fixed to one point of view, uh, which is the main character's point of view, Geralt's point of view, and uh, you can't do uh, cuts uh, like you would do in a movie where you show action, actions and events happening in a different place, different time sometimes. Uh, you, are, uh, you, you are focused on just this one character and how he sees the world. So basically you're traveling through the world with like, like a point of view camera almost. Mm -hmm. Um, this is uh, a storytelling challenge, definitely, because we have to um, make all the important events happen in front of the character, and this means we have to justify their presence in these events, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we do sometimes in the games, uh, Witcher 1, Witcher 2, Witcher 3, um, allow you to play as a different character, uh, so that will be the example of uh, Ciri, for example, who, uh, who you get to play as, as like an ex exciting change of pace, uh, from time to time to see how uh, the story uh, develops from, for her, from her point of view because arguably she is the main character of The Witcher 3, right? You play as Geralt, but you kind of help her, help her right? Yeah, she, I mean, to be honest, I think she's all kind of all of our favorite. Mm -hmm. So we all like Siri very much. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing is also we talked about, you know, that we create an open world and not just a stage, mm -hmm. but it also kind of creates these challenges for actually making a story then because usually if you want to tell a story, you know, you want to go from A to B to C, and usually you want to make the choices that are, you know, best for the flow of the story. Mm -hmm. But we, of course, you know, say we want to make an open world so you can run everywhere. So as an example, if you're walking around with a character, player might decide to just run away. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, our game and our stories, they still kind of need to work. Uh, so it is actually often our job to essentially make sure that whatever action the player can take, 
the story still works, and you know, sometimes the story notices. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a character might, you know, yeah, complain if right? you're rude to them. <laughs> and I think that's always, yeah. it's always nice when you can actually, as a player, I think, find these little spots. Mm. But of course, also, it's kind of one challenge that we have is to not make you want to run away, mm -hmm, to actually mm -hmm. make you want to follow that mm -hmm. story along. And usually, you know, when we can tell that, you know, while playing our quests, people just, you know, they start looking around and they start running away. And probably something's also wrong with our quest and we should change our approach a little. Yeah. This might actually happen when you present choices that are not um, intuitive for the player at the point where, where they are presented to you. Mm -hmm. Because as uh, quest designers, we have to uh, sort of uh, anticipate what would be the natural reactions, not only for the player, but also for Geralt, uh, when presented with a problem, right? Uh, it, it really feels bad when you want to uh, approach a certain situation from a certain, mm, in, in a certain way, and the game doesn't present you with that option. That, that, that's, that's not fun. So what we need to do is we need to anticipate uh, what the player might want to do, and then when that choice presents itself, uh, it feels really good because you can you can actually do that thing that you that logically made sense to you, right? Mm -hmm. And also, we kind of have you have to give you that power mm -hmm. to be able to make those choices. So all three of the Witcher games are RPGs, so role-playing games, and you usually play the role of Geralt of Rivia. Mm -hmm. Thing is, Geralt of course knows the rules of the world of the Witcher. He knows the culture. He knows the politics. And then it is also our job to make the player be able to know all of these things. So, you know, we're not going to start the game by saying, okay, you're in the kingdom of Redania. This is the king of Redania. This is, you know, all the laws that exist. But we kind of try to do it naturally. So mm -hmm. as an example, you might walk by some peasants that complain about, you know, someone raised the taxes again. And these kind of, you know, details where you really start, you know, getting a feeling for how the world works. Mm -hmm. What is the culture? What kind of religions do people have? What do they, what do they believe in? And then, once you get all of that information, I think you're also able to, you know, make choices. Yes. Because if you don't have any information to base your decisions on, that's not a good choice. That's just, you know, choosing A and B, and I don't know what A and B are, or, you know, what they could cause. So that's also a very important job that we have to make that possible. And sometimes uh, we use the player character, the player's character, Geralt, as, as a tool for exposition. Yes. Uh, because he does know this stuff, so he can use it. Uh, he can tell it uh, to the player, so to speak. Um, but this also uh, builds into the the fact of player expectations, um, because you know the, the Witcher universe is uh, books, comics, uh, series, movies. There's this famous Polish movie, um, and all of all of this stuff has built uh, a layer of expectations that uh, fans. Even even us, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I remember the first time we saw the Yennefer model. Uh, like everyone gathered at uh, Mateusz Tomaszkiewicz's uh, computer, our yeah. quest director. Well, he was lead back then, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and everyone gathered around his computer, and they were looking at how Yennefer looks in the game. It was the first time I saw her, and everyone had their opinions, of course. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, it was it was really uh, something to see, you know the mental image that we had of her after mm -hmm. reading the books and, and watching the movies um, rendered on the computer screen. And then, you know, a big privilege of getting to actually use this model, right? And, yeah. and make quests with it and all of that stuff. So, so yeah. All right, so maybe let's get a little bit to the star of our games, uh, which is Geralt of Rivia. And of course, you know, as you're playing The Witcher, you're playing Geralt, and there are some unique challenges when essentially making him a video game character that you as a player are controlling. Maybe let's talk a little bit mm -hmm. about that part. Yeah, this is this is actually super interesting because I noticed it first when I played The Witcher 1 as a fan. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this whole uh, gamut of actions that Geralt does that are mentioned in the books. Um, the making of potions, obviously the sword fighting, uh, horse riding, uh, all these things that uh, kind of build a picture of uh, what it is, what it means to be a witcher um, in, in this world, right? Um, and for this experience in the game to be immersive, uh, we need to translate all of that into gameplay actions, into things that the player can do. Uh, because by doing these things, uh, by sword fighting, by mixing potions, researching monsters, um, talking to people really uh, also, uh, that's a big part of it, um, you start to feel like uh, like a witcher basically, because that's what you're doing uh, for your, your interaction with the game, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's also for us, we just had to pretty much adopt his character. 
uh, because I think for many people when they see Geralt for the first time, they you know they think like, oh, he has a deep raspy voice. He's probably some graph, you know, some action hero. But the thing is, Geralt is a bit more than that. He actually has a lot of depth as a character. Yes. I really like his dry humor uh, very much, and he has you know very interesting friendships. Uh, you know, I always love it when he discusses philosophy with his friends. Uh, you know, my favorite Regis. Mm -hmm. It's always the best times. <laughs> uh, but also, yeah. basically, you know, Geralt has a unique role in this world. He is a mutant. And the world of The Witcher, you know, is a fantasy world, but also it has lots of, you know, real life topics. There's lots of racism in this world. You know, there's sexism. It is a, you know, it is a fantasy world, but it also it's, it's kind of... Place. Exactly. It is a place that could have existed, you know, mm -hmm. you know, mix the real medieval world with fantasy. Mm -hmm. So Geralt is an outsider. Geralt has, you know, cat eyes. He has white hair and people do know what a Witcher is. A Witcher is there to kill monsters. But for most people, a witcher is not that much better than a monster. They're like accepted he's as long mutant, as they do right? their job. Exactly, he, he, they're a he, mutant. He says that he's not human multiple times. Yeah, he exactly. Feel like he yeah. belongs to the race, really. Yeah, that's the thing. Like people, you know, tend to spit at him when they see mm. him in the streets, and you are essentially inhabiting this role. Like Geralt is not a shining hero in a shining armor. Uh, he usually, often, you know, he tries. To tries. do the right thing, but usually, you know, a witcher is supposed to stay neutral. But, you know, in the end, uh, mm. if he's to make a choice between good and evil, he'd rather not make a choice at all. Uh, so, of course, you know, we have to honor that character and, you know, make you really inhabit him as a real person. All right, so we now talked for quite a while about, you know, the witcher and our experiences creating the stories, our memories of making the quest in the witcher. and. I hope it kind of came across how much we love uh, the games and you know our jobs making them. And there's also uh, one other thing we want to share with you, uh, because we've talked about our own memories, uh, mainly from The Witcher 3 and the expansions, but uh, there are people at the company who have been here way longer than us, mm -hmm. uh, since Witcher 1 times basically. And um, yeah, they also have their own memories, which I invite you to see. Po prostu do dowodu walne takie to jest dobre oświetlenie. To jest moje miejsce. Are we talking to each other? Are we talking to one of the cameras? Or... I'm ready to go. Is everybody ready? To be fine, the trailer. Yeah, I remember Badowski talking about this like it has to be a magic hour. Współpraca z Tomkiem Bagińskim, początek naszej znajomości. To trailer, który oglądałem nie myśląc jeszcze o tym, że mogę pracować w branży gier. Tak, to jest w ogóle pierwsza rzecz, którą, którą zrobiliśmy, z której byliśmy bardzo dumni. Ja pamiętam, że wtedy to było a, z, y, dla nas strasznie ważna rzecz, bo to było CG. Pierwszy CG i to było coś niezwykłego. I was kind of proud when this came out and uh, I thought like, I yeah, we, we, we can do stuff. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do really nice stuff. Although the hair suck. <laughs> ja pamiętam, że mm, w pracy u mojej żony mm, wszystkim paniom strasznie się podobał właśnie ten Wiedźmin i mówiły, że, że będzie super. What was the name of the character that Geralt actually used as his bait? I remember absolutely loving his cartoonish way of running. His legs just seemed to spin around like... Do, 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 do. Oh, no. Niesamowite. <laughs> well, you know what it is. Jakie to były barwy? zdjęcie z... Z internetu to jest w zasadzie memowe zdjęcie. Jest. I never saw this actually. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen this photo. No, po prostu nie było nas stać na wynajęcie dużej budki. 
zrobienie, zrobienie tam standu was, własnego. Nie jest tak źle. Yeah. The E3 came a long way from kind of... Oh yeah, well our presence at E3 has come a long way, but I think E3 has come a long way as well. Byliśmy taką grupą osób, która chciała zawojować, być lepsza od tych innych produkcji, które były wtedy na rynku. Pamiątka, jak wygląda branża gier komputerowych w Polsce, gdy powstawał pierwszy Wiedźmin. To była trochę taka wolna amerykanka, troszeczkę taki dziki zachód. Trzeba było zbudować cały łańcuch y, takich hostów, którzy łapali dziennikarzy, przeprowadzali tam, odprowadzali, to oczywiście było... Na siłę. No, no to było duże przedsięwzięcie i wszystko robiliśmy w takiej tak, taktyce partyzanckiej. Pamiętam, że mieliśmy plakaty, które chcieliśmy rozdawać i nikt ich nie chciał brać i wymyśliliśmy, że wbijemy się do kolejki Blizzarda i dawaliśmy ludziom stojącym w kolejce i nas goniła ochrona. Oh. Young and beautiful. It was a GDC, right? I was doing some GDC stuff, yeah. and the Płatkow called me like, hey, you know what? There is this party you have to attend in the evening. I was like, but I have stuff, and he's like, no, no, just get into the taxi and, and come in, and you'll be fine. And then I came in, and there's like a room with, like filled with 10,000 people, basically. <laughs> and they give me the on microphone the stage, on yeah. the stage, saying that I'm supposed to say something. <laughs> in fact, the last no. time I was here, uh, Donald gave me a gift. Ah. Uh, the video game developed here in Poland that's won fans uh, the world over, uh, The Witcher. Uh, I confess, I'm not very good at video games, but uh, I've been told that it is a great example of Poland's yes, so uh, place in the global economy. Yes, so Oglądaliśmy przed chwilą to takie krzesełko i to stanowisko, a następna rzecz, którą oglądamy, to jest prezydent Obama, który wypowiada się o Wiedźminie i to wszystko na przestrzeni dosłownie kilku lat. To w bardzo krótkim czasie zrobiliśmy jakiś taki ogromny skok do przodu. W zasadzie no, tylko dzięki e, pracy ciężkiej bardzo wielu ludzi. Tak, wtedy, wtedy sprawy jakoś przyspieszyły mm -hmm. totalnie. To tak. znaczy nagle, nagle okazało się, że... To jest głupio o tym mówić, ale że Wiedźmy stał się jakąś, jakąś, jakąś rzeczą, która w ogóle łączy Polaków. Jest, mm -hmm. jest, to jest wszystkich dobro. Tak, to chyba był ten taki moment w którym zacząłem sobie coraz mocniej zdawać sprawę z tego, jak bardzo jest to ważne w skali globalnej. Ktoś zadzwonił z, z kancelarii y, na recepcję i powiedział, że tutaj mają taką prośbę, chcieliby prezent dla prezydenta Baracka Obamy, czy mogą dostać grę w jakiejkolwiek edycji. Ludzie z recepcji pomyśleli, że to jest chyba jakiś dowcip troszkę i że ktoś tam próbuje Ściemnić, więc poprosili o kontakt osobisty, żeby ktoś przyszedł. Wystosowaliśmy list od zarządu do prezydenta Obamy. Mieliśmy ileś wersji wydrukowane na takim bardzo ładnym papierze i jak się podpisywałem, to źle się podpisałem, to musi ładniej. <grym> Pamiętam, że ktoś biegał i, i prosił o podpisy i na pytanie dla kogo, to dla Obamy. I wszyscy, aha, to jasne, dawali podpis i zajmowali się swoimi rzeczami. Wanna? Ojej. No, Garold w wannie. Jak jeździliśmy pokazywać grę, to za każdym razem na każdym komputerze było trzeba sprawdzić, czy działa, ustawić i pograć kilka minut. W związku z tym tą scenę widziałem nieprzyzwoicie dużo razy. He has very pretty feet. He has, his feet are too pretty for a witcher. It should, there should be calluses. So? Yeah, there should be calluses there and so on and so forth. <laughs> No, I'm serious. There should be boils and this, man. No, it's iconic. No, tak. To jest iconic. To zostanie na zawsze. Ja zasadniczo w ogóle tak się kąpię w, w codziennie. Z takimi fajnymi znaczy, zabawkami. No, tak, zabawki są mojego syna, ale... Geralt ilustrował wszystkie artykuły na PC Gamerze i za każdym razem, gdy nie dali mm, jako ilustracji tego artykułu Geralta w wannie, to wszyscy e, czytelnicy protestowali głośno i musieli przywracać ilustracje tak, żeby to był rzeczywiście Geralt w wannie. But it was a lot of work. Even the sponge that floats on the, on the surface of the surface of it and it has like a special shader. Na Prima Aprilis zrobiliśmy kiedyś figurkę i to był prototyp, jedna, jedna sztuka na drukarce 3D e, stworzona, ale musieliśmy później zrobić prawdziwego, bo zbyt dużo osób chciało koniecznie, żeby była prawdziwa, a nie tylko Prima Aprilisowym fejkiem. Well, well, well. Wow, 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 mówiłem. Poznaję tego gościa. 
Trochę poszła technologia na czyś. To jest in inwencja y modelarzy, nie, nie moja, y żeby... A po żeby papier, się żeby, żeby mogli to zrobić? I <laughs> potem już podpisałem, jak się już zrobiliśmy bardzo profesjonalnie. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long story. I need, I, I, I need a drink. Widzę teraz, jak strasznie e, dużo tam gadali w tych dialogach. Teraz już tak nie robi się gier. E, no ale to oczywiście miało swój urok. Widać właśnie, tak jak powiedziałeś, nie? jak strasznie się technologia zmieniła. We came a long way from this. I hope from that. Do, do you know what I think? Yes, we, we've definitely come a long way. We've definitely come a long way from a lot of things here. Nie tylko jeżeli chodzi o grafikę, ale też mimikę postaci, no w ogóle wszystkie animacje, to w jakiś sposób prezentowane jest scena. The repeating non-met in dialogue. It was like, okay, so if you exit, exit the conversation here and you reinitiate the conversation, he'll say this line over and over again. I'm all ears, White Wolf. I'm all ears, White Wolf. I'm all ears, White Wolf. We kind of knew how to use them, but kind of didn't know how to use them. So there were some really awkward ones, like, hey, Witcher, you know, good to see you. And you'd get that, you know, 35 times during a conversation. I with hated that. It was one of the priorities to get rid of that. Wiedźmin 1, Wiedźmin 2, Wiedźmin 3. E, widać, jak się starzał razem z nami. No, trzech Geraltów zmieniających się. To, to, jest, to jest w ogóle, to jest wielowymiarowe. Completely. A raw badass. Cała stylistyka tego, to jest jed w jedynce mieliśmy astetyczne białe tło, w trójce podobnie, a w dwójce totalny Hollywood, eksplozje, tak, wszystko tak. w ogniu, a ty idziesz w slow motion, tak, e, oddalając się od płomieni. To jest scena y, z Desperado, y, jak, jak z Banderasem. No, ale to smaczy ogień, to trochę usprawiedliwia. Troszeczkę. I nie ma gitary. Oczywiście to też jest cała generacja te technologiczna. Pierwszy Wiedźmin składający się z nie wiem, 15 tysięcy trójkątów, a, a kolejny to już jakieś w ogóle setki. Nawet mi nie mówię o trójkątach tak. w Wiedźminie pierwszym, drugim czy trzecim. No to wiesz, to jest chodząca lokacja. With The Witcher 2 we actually gave body to the, the continent. You know? yeah, we, we started sailed. to explore. We, yeah, we, there is a we started universe, sailing. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, we started, we, we started exploring the universe. Przy dwójce to chyba to Okładka trochę tak powstawała. Ja pamiętam, że mieliśmy masę różnych wersji okładek z wszystkich gier ze świata i bardzo chcieliśmy się inspirować e, najlepszymi. Przy e, okładce do trójki to już było trochę tak, co nam się najbardziej podoba i co uważamy, że najbardziej pasuje. No i potem już taki do, super dojrzały tak, facio to... z Wiedźmina trzeciego. Najlepszy. E, no, jest e, Najlepszy. zdecydowanie najbardziej taki, taki Data. Been through hell and high water, you and me. The fact is, you know me better than anyone else does. To ja się przy tym nie dlaczego wzruszam i mam ciarki. Thanks for everything. And no, we all miss you. No, to jest cel faktor. So, might be my birthday, but I say, here's to you. Jak o nim myślę, to sobie przypominam, no tak, on jest takim w sumie podsumowaniem, że to się skończyło i nie, 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 to on nie istnieje. No, y, to świetne zakończenie trzeciej części Wiedźmina y, w są. To jest taka kropka na D. Właśnie zakończona jeszcze w takim miejscu, które bardzo przyjemnie się kojarzy. Mm -hmm. Wakacyjnie, urlopowo. I just need to say something that yeah. we went a hell lot of work to actually oppress all our textures and, and we, we, we have much better textures nowadays so so I'm so proud of <laughs> So this is shit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kazaliśmy go na Paxie w Seattle na panelu urodzinowym i pamiętam, że tam odważyliśmy się wynająć taką wielką salę taki amfiteatr na 2300 miejsc. E Miałem mega stres, że nie wypełnimy sali, ale potem się okazało, że było na full i mega wrażenie było. No, ciar faktor. No, łezka w łuku się kręci. Czy to no. koniec? <laughs> Geralt started talking to uh, gamers directly. You know, we broke the fourth wall and, you know, there was a little bit of winking, a little bit of smile. That sort of freed us up a little bit, you know. And I think there's, oh, there, there's still lots more to do with this range. And especially with the better textures. <laughs> especially with the better textures. Ready? Such
Nie ma drugiego człowieka, na którego bym tak często wpadał leżącego na ziemi w jakiejś salce, jak Marcin. Myślałem wiele razy, że salka jest pusta, po czym się okazywało, że Marcin leży na ziemi i z kimś rozmawia. I myślałem na początku, że to jest jedyna pozycja, w której spotyka się z ludźmi. He is the really, really grumpy, but sometimes interesting folk that I know here. And I would like to thank him for this years of cooperation. Pamiętam, jak pojechaliśmy do Kolonii na targi, no i wszyscy się przygotowywali. Między innymi były takie dodatkowe atrakcje na zewnątrz. I była, była taka atrakcja, która polegała na tym, że wchodziło się do wielkiej kuli przezroczystej i na takim ograniczonym boisku można było się poturlać. I ty wskoczyłeś do tej kuli i tak ją rozbujałeś, że wyskoczyłeś poza, poza to boisko i gdzieś tam się daleko poturlałeś. I to jest w ogóle taki symbol tego, że jak obojętnie w jakich momentach kryzysowych. Ty jesteś niezłomny, pełen energii i to w ogóle się nie zmieniło. Nie będę opowiadał żadnych kompromitujących rzeczy, no, no. ani niczego sensacyjnego, tylko opowiem, że y, za każdym razem właśnie jak się zbliżała premiera gry, gra jeździła na targi, jak właśnie produkowane były te wszystkie trailery i zawsze łapałem się za głowę, o Boże, nie? ile tam jest spoilerów, a to jest w ogóle takie nieortodoksyjne, nie? Tu uspokajałeś, nie, nie, tak się robi, to jest wszystko dobrze, wszystko właśnie na dobre wyszło i że miałeś Racji. Ty, Adam, a może byśmy zrobili tutaj, nie wiem, wielkiego niedźwiedzia, który wychodzi na początek, potem robi mu ujęcie na coś tam, na coś tam, na coś tam i tak tworzyliśmy pewne, te, pewien scenariusz, żeby wizualnie było jeszcze fajniej, żeby było jeszcze bardziej atrakcyjnie i chyba to dla mnie jest najważniejsze w, w pracy z Tobą. I don't know a more precise individual uh, in my life. You're thin and you're lanky and physically you remind me of a scalpel. You're Krzysztof the Scalpel Christian. Drugą rzecz jeszcze powiem, pamiętam, że kiedyś na korytarzu żeście sobie siedzieli i kombinowali i przechodzę wam tak zazdrościłem strasznie. Tam były jakieś wykresy, smok, kreska, coś, tutaj elfy, atak. <laughs> Ja i mówię, wow, ale super, mamy taką wielką sesję roleplaying, która trwa przez pół ich życia. Pamiętasz, jak skończyliśmy Wiedźmina I mm -hmm. i zrobiliśmy imprezę taką małą i w pewnym momencie ktoś z nas wpadł na pomysł, nie wiem, czy to nie ty czasami, żeby te wielkie tablice korkowe, na których błędy przechodziły z, jednego, z jednej kolumny do drugiej, a już były niepotrzebne, która była zamknięta, żeby je rozwalić, żeby już mieć... Żeby, żeby zrobić jakąś krowkę nad niej, żeby zniszczyć te wszystkie, te wszystkie, taski, wszystkie problemy, które, wszystkie problemy, które były i, i, i pamiętam, że zrobiliśmy to, byliśmy bardzo niegrzeczni. If you've been with us from the start, then you're no stranger to their music. Our house band is back. The amazing Martin Pibivovich and Percival, take it away.
thanks again, Martin Kubibovich and Percival for setting us up right. For this panel, we've lost the deck of destiny because, well, basically from this point on, only pure knowledge can save you. The name of the game is Geralt of, wait for it, Trivia. Such a good day, whoever came up with that. And the goal is to determine which of my next panelists truly deserve the title of Law Master. So let's give it up for showrunner, executive producer, and all round witch or whiz, Lauren Schmidt Hisrick. <laughs> I feel like Oprah. Like, ah! I want that introduction everywhere. That's amazing. I'm for hire. <laughs> I'll just follow you around, shouting your name loudly with an arm gesture. Love it. I'm Excellent. so ready for this game. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, she's joined by the man who follows in her footsteps, writer on The Witcher and showrunner for The Witcher Blood Origin, it's Declan de Barra! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, are you all right, Declan? You I'm okay? I'm good, I'm good. I'm just uh, heat up and ready to uh, destroy my former friend who is now my mortal enemy. Oh, wow! Impressive. I see how we're playing this game. Yes, gonna dirty, get a little, uh, dirty, dirty. Get a little dirty, huh? Absolutely. Can't wait. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and, uh, and joining us from Poland are two men with as much Witcher knowledge as one can pretty much get. CD Projekt Red lead quest designers Błaże Augustnik and Philippe Weber. Hello. Hi, Błaże, how hi. are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks. Yeah, you're good, you're happy, you're excited? <laughs> yeah, 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 I am, sure. I, I want to see what we are going to do here. <laughs> <laughs> and Philippe, how, how confident do you feel? Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I have to admit, I'm very excited, but... We're gonna fight, uh, that's sure. <laughs> All right, well, fair enough. I think it's, it's one of these sort of like weird things where you're like, no one's really competitive, but then suddenly everyone's very... Yeah. yeah. Look <laughs> at you leaning in your seat, all aggressively ready, Declan. Anyway, let me explain basically the game mechanics of like how this is gonna work. So uh, you're divided into teams. So uh, Lauren and Boisier, you're the blue team, right? And Declan and Philippe, you are the red team, okay? So in a minute, I'll start with the questions and there's basically going to be nine in total, which is four for each and then one decidal, deciding final question for all of you. And each question earns your team one point, but answer incorrectly and the opposing team has the opportunity to potentially steal your point. So, I mean, feel free to obviously deliberate with your counterparts, your other team members, but obviously the opposing team is listening, so don't give too much away or you might lose a point. Uh, and, you know, you viewers at home, do you think that you can outdo the pros at all of these Witcher lore questions? But do share your answers with us by tweeting using the hashtag WitcherCon. Right, hopefully that's all clear. It is. Medium. Yep. Lauren, that you do it know is, yeah. that we have replaced, uh, the, there's panels underneath you. If you get a wrong answer, you go into the fiery depth. <laughs> no pressure. Whatsoever. No pressure at all. I mean, I'm, I'm confident. I think, I think Bajé and I have was that? here. It's actually fire and spikes. Fire and spikes. Just when you think fire can't get any worse, there's spikes into the mix. Well, <laughs> just mean your weird little mind works, Declan, but we like it. That's all good. Um, okay, so first question is for the blue team. So let's see how well you really know dear old Geralt. Oof. So for a man of surprisingly few words, he's actually got a huge amount of monikers. Can you name all six of them? Six. Six. There's is, six. There is six I of them. I have them on this card here, just in <laughs> case. Does the Witcher count? No. <laughs> I mean, no. Okay, let's no. go with the, the easy six. ones then. Let's get okay. the easy ones out of the way, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's the White Wolf, the White Wolf, which in Elven or Elvish is Gwynblade. In English, yes. that will be pronounced how? Gwynblade? Gwynblade. Gwynblade. It's Welsh, I yeah. think. Yes. That's two. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, butcher, so we got two. butcher of Blaviken, of course. One of the more yeah. popular ones. Classic. classic. The classic B.O.B. Isn't, isn't there another oh, Butcher the, one? There's another yeah. one with Butcher. The Butcher of White Orchard. White yes, think. okay, you okay. got four. Yes. Okay. Couple more and to there's, go. There's another one I wanted to say about. Uh, there's the one we used in the game also. It's a throwaway, throwaway line in the books. Uh, it's Ravix of Fourhorn. Fourhorn, yes. Wow. In Polish. Yeah, that's right. So, Sounds kind of dirty. Yeah, yeah. Sounds kind of dirty. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever... No, no it's okay, just so, Polish. So we... <laughs> just okay, all Polish sound dirty. <laughs> <laughs> we got one more. One okay, more. One Can more, you get it? More. It's a really... Um, it's really going to kick yourself. It's okay. a quite straightforward one. Uh, the, the white one? Just the white one, the white one. Let's see if they've got it, it right. It? And they have, yes. All six right. So okay. the point goes to you, Lauren. Nice. Kicking see? off, that was a tough, 
take that's a, a that's, a, that's yeah. like a multi. I think we get more points for that because that's a lot I'm of answers. I'm registering a protest because you you missed these two most crucial names, which is Stan the Hat. <laughs> oh. Where Stan the Hat is his side gig where he, he uh, sells illicit kittens in Blaviken. <laughs> And Bob. Bob is Bob. a nice name for a... Uh, Bob. That's a nice name for cool. a witcher. Bob. Bob. Bob the uh, witcher. And any Blackadder fans out there will yes. get that. <laughs> and you know why he said uh, it like that? Why? Because he used to have a stutter, so it was Bob. Bob. Yeah. Well, we also forgot a really important one. Because uh, when Geralt was a young guy, uh, Vesemir asked him to, you know, what's your proper witcher name? And I think he wanted to be Roger Eric Duot Bellegarde. And Vesemir told him he's an idiot. So I think that's that's always my favorite one. Yeah, but he was a little kid then. Yeah. That's a very uh, long name. We also, we also could, could say that it's it's Sir Geralt because he did get knighted at some point, right? Right. That's a good point. Yeah. I feel like it, there's a lot of... Geralt. Yeah, As we you said, have Mev stepping in. Like, how long can we keep going? Right no, no, now? It's, <laughs> the, the point's already gone. Oh, I, think that's, okay. I think that's basically it. But it was oh, fun okay, to hear okay. all these other okay, names. So that was pretty enough. good. So, um, <laughs> Red Team... Um, so now we're on the topic of Geralt. Which creature or being gave Geralt the scar across his left eye? Was it from winking too much? <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> yeah, those are excellent questions. <laughs> Think it has something to do with a, a bird sounding name. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're going to yeah. need to be a little so, bit more specific than that. Cockatrice of something. A little bit more specific Spala. than that. Spala. Cockatrice of Spala? Ah, uh, yes, that they got it. it right. Ding, 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 ding. Point to the red team. So, yeah. Oh, even Steven. How many times has that said Thank in the game? Much. How many times? Has it said a lot? I, I'll be completely honest. I think it's just kind of a throwaway line. It's like, it's like, it's Geralt mentions it, but I could not recall if there is a big story behind it. That seems like something maybe we should do at some point. <laughs> this is some sort of worrying, wibbly law we need to yeah. like hammer yes. out here. <laughs> I'm not okay with that. <laughs> I'm very disappointed that that has been used because it's the best character name ever. Because uh, could you imagine like Witcher season seven? And it's like, good evening, I am the cockatrice of Spala. I <laughs> come to kill you. I would fully watch that. I don't that. think it talks. Fully watch that. You don't think it talks? <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Next question for the blue team. All right, so from ghoul bites uh, to other things that have kind of strange effects on the mind and body, who or what is Rudwaith Carthian? Is it one, a monster that controls minds? Is it two, an exotic plant? Is it three, heartache in Hanlinga? Or is it four, an influential mage? Mm, it sounds made up. <laughs> <laughs> Most law does, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. I think I know this that, one. That's true, that's true. But I'm afraid yeah, of saying ahead. it. Uh, okay, we're gonna try it. Just I, do it, just do it. I Just think it. it's an exotic plant. Are they right? Is it an exotic plant? Yes, you are <gasps> correct. Nice. Point. I didn't even have to phone a friend. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. I'm just pretending I did. <laughs> okay, right, red team, are you ready? Oh, wow, very ready. Aggressively so. Right, okay, so it's not just plants that you should be wary of in The Witcher. The universe is full of dangerous creatures too, and each one more horrendous than the last. Which far from friendly foe's silhouette do we see here? Is it number one, a gold dragon? Number two, a basilisk? Number three, a griffin? Or number four, a green dragon? Let's see it. First of all, I did not approve this picture of me <laughs> at all. <laughs> it's... it's like a weird Rorschach uh, test, right? Uh, this, yeah. It is like a griffin had copulation effects with a basilisk and had a baby and fed it fire. I it don't looks know. like me coming home from a night out. I think I think because <laughs> the way it's hunched over, what would, you, what would you think, a basilisk or a or a griffin? No, it's not a griffin. I mean, may, maybe it's a bit cheating because I do recognize that it's from the game. So I, <laughs> you know, but it's, you know, it's made for me. It's not so cheating, okay. that's the point of you being here. <laughs> What are you going with? Final answer. How long answer? are you going to let us yeah, go it's, back it's, and it's, forth? It's, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it should be a basilisk, but it could also be a cockatrice, maybe of Spala, but I will go with basilisk because there's no cockatrice here. Or it could be <laughs> That's me. not one of the answers. Hold okay. On. If I was like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it's kind of you. It's very similar. Like if you spelt, spilt some wine on the floor <laughs> exactly. or something. Yeah, very similar. Okay, let's find out if they've got the correct answer. Yes, it is number two, a basilisk. Well done. Point. Oh, this is getting... 
Ooh, okay, I'm into this. This is fun. Right, question for the blue team now. Now, we already know that Henry Cavill was a huge fan of the books and the games, but it seems that he wasn't alone. I mean, apparently, Lauren Declan, um, your colleague, uh, Tomasz Baginski, wanted to get the show made so badly that he went kind of all in on a very extreme gesture. But what gesture was that? Number one, he wrote a passionate 25-page letter telling Sapkowski why the show needed to be made. Was it number two that he showed up at Sokovsky's office to serenade him for a full hour? <laughs> sort of hope that's true. Number three, he made a pilot episode in which he portrayed both Geralt, Yennefer and Siri. Actually, no, scratch that. I want that one to be the one. Uh, or number four, <laughs> he lobbied to make The Witcher part of Polish cultural heritage and thus secure a special grant needed to kickstart production. So many good endings here, but which I, one is I'm it? I'm a big fan of the second one. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard and, Tomek And I would like to live in a yeah. world where this is true, but I don't <laughs> think it's true. <laughs> so, do you know? I actually, I do, I know this one. Yeah. Um, although I'm still a little bit surprised by the detail that I didn't know, <laughs> which is I knew that he wrote Sapkowski a letter. Yeah. But I'm going to have to make fun of him because who writes a 25 page letter? I mean, first of all, who writes a letter anyway? Yeah. But like, I mean, I presume it was, was it handwritten? I'm sure. I'm sure. There's no way that was like, no. it's got to be cursive with like yes. a quill or something. I really. 25 pages. Did you read it? Do you think he read it all? I do think he read it. I mean, it's Sapkowski. I think, yeah, I think yeah. absolutely he read it. Yeah, and then okay. he probably ripped it up and threw it away. Really <laughs> Oh, that's a shame. I really wish that this existed yeah, so that we could read it. I want to know what anyone good. can say for 25 pages. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. But should we check that the answer's right? <laughs> Unsurprisingly, it is correct. Okay. Um, well, can, you, can you get it somewhere? Can you read it? It's be I... awesome. we got to get a copy. Yes. Of yeah, I bet yeah. we can ask for it. I think this needs to happen. But, but I also yeah. think we should. we should have him serenade. Sapkowski at Absolutely. some point, just for the sake of Definitely. our glee. That Definitely. did happen. He told me this no. on a drunken night out. He's, he's, he, because he got turned down on the 25-page letter, he, because he camped outside that door in the cold and the wet for 10 long nights, and eventually <laughs> he just those started raining down soggy letters, pieces of letter, and it's like, go away from my window. So he starts to sing, <laughs> fails, he, comes, he leaves, he comes back one month later with the real thing that changed the whole deal which was 25 barbari uh, barbarian mimic owls, which he set upon Sapowski uh, to fly through his window. And every time he would try and go to sleep, he would go, we need to do this. This must happen. Read the letter. Give in to Tomek. And it worked. Now you guys see why the writer's room of The Witcher is so much fun. <laughs> this is bad. Yeah, madness. <laughs> I love it. But it worked for him, so it was it great. It did. It's great. It's oh, good. We have to get this letter. Yes. Lovely. I mean, moving on. Red team. Okay, so uh, as you all know well, lots of things get lost on the cutting room floor, and you know some probably is better for the better. Um, which cut did CDPR regret though? In retrospect, was it number one, a sequence where Siri fights monsters whilst ice skating? Is it number two, the ability to swap horses? That's just mean, poor Roach. What would the game be without? Um, three, making the game a multiplayer. Or four, making Geralt an elven mage. I remember this one. You got the easy one. It's a um, cheating question again. Of course I know that. You know that one? <laughs> you know it. But yeah, I, we all know but it. Like, like, I'll, I'll give you a try, because I always get the, you know, the, the video game questions. Yeah, maybe uh, because I don't know the answer, I'm going to have to guess here. It's either going to be swapping horses or ice skating with monsters. I, I mean, ice skating with monsters. I hope that was the thing because uh, imagine at the end of it, like she does a pirouette, chops the head off a ghoul, and then there's like people at the end holding up scores, you know, 10.9, technical merit, you know, gore factor nine. I love that. It, it, that. I would watch more ice skating shows if there was more right? bloodshed. Mm -hmm. That's, That's the only thing that's missing. Right. This needs to happen in the Olympics, monster but, ice skating. But, I mean, Siri has some great scenes, ice skating and, you know, hurting yeah. people. So, uh... It has to be that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for helping me. I'm for, Philip, yeah. Philip, is that right, Philip? <laughs> I, I would say, yeah, it's right, it's right. It's, it's one that hurts the most. There's, you know, of course, always many cuts that hurt us a lot. Uh, one colleague of mine had a bad cut that was called Troll Poop. He's still very sad about that one, but the ice skating is definitely one of we the hardest course, one. Though. Yeah. yeah true. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah ice skating. Let's, Perfect. Let's see if they're right. And you're right. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> wow, yeah, you 
accidentally. You got you got too involved in being right there. I did. No. Oh, okay. All right. It's all right. Still all to play for. Don't worry. So, um. Right, Lauren, okay, uh, blue team. Now, when you think of The Witcher, I mean, it's really hard to not think of monsters. And, you know, Geralt may not actually face that many monsters in the books, but he does see his fair share within the series, uh, uh, you know, of the games and the show. My question is, which monster isn't mentioned in the books and games? So, is it number one, the Doppler? Number two, Alp? Is it number three, Sylvan? Or four, Selkimore? Okay, so the Alp is a vampire, and it's definitely mentioned. The Sylvan is mentioned as well, and Doppler has its own story, and yep. there's like a character. I don't remember the Selkimo anywhere, so that would be my bet. I am going to Do firmly agree? agree on that one, yes. Okay, right, are they right? <laughs> Yes, they are. Yes, they are. You guys, this is why well, obviously you're going to know all the answers. <laughs> it would be mad if you didn't. Right? <laughs> okay, so um, there's a bit of a reason why I didn't ask you that question, uh, Declan, because I believe that actually this we're about to see here is your uh, is your handiwork. Indeed, that is that is it. And there was another Ooh. picture of yeah. it actually swallowed up poor Geralt. Yeah. And then Geralt cut his way from the inside out. Yeah. Killing the Selkie Maw. Yeah. And then he flees past. Yaskier was going, what's going on? <laughs> and then thousands of baby selkie moths come out chasing <laughs> him while Geralt's covered in slime. Yeah. But um, obviously, you know, we had to change for the script and I had finished the writer's room and you called me while I was on holiday in Spain going, I need some dialogue for a pub patron who's describing this scene. <laughs> and I was on a train and I might have had a few riacas <laughs> and uh, I like to act out the dialogue. So there was a packed train and I was going, you know, covered him all it did, <laughs> swallowed him, giant obsidian teeth of death. And uh, everybody on the train was uh, loving it. Uh, loving it. Uh, well, not loving it, calling the police. Yeah. Did you and get your own seat though? There everyone's I like, did. I'm just everyone, gonna like slowly move away. away from that. So I was texting it to Lauren. <laughs> And it, and it made the cut, so it I'm did. delighted. It absolutely did. It, what didn't make the cut is the actual Silky Maw. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, next next Aww. time. That's, but we got the the Kralak in, so yep. I was really happy, which no, is the, the Rochan. I have to say, that is a really great scene. Like, his whole speech there where you're like, it's it's brilliant. It's one of those things that where it works out better not actually showing it. Um, yes. Uh, it was really cool. And um, that was Lauren's smart yeah. idea. Save a bit of money on special effects there. Just Yeah, totally. It's, right, we've got another question for the red team here, and it's another one about names. So... Who is the Viscount de Lettenhove? Is it number one, the Ike of Denzile? Is it number two, Yaskier or Dandelion? Or is it three, the Detlef van Echretein? Man, I'm having a day. Four, Gonter Odim. We would all be burned at the stake, quite rightfully so, if we didn't know this. <laughs> Aggressive. Yeah, Posse. I agree. <laughs> the fans would drag us out and bury us alive. Okay. It is Yaskir and Dandelion. Of course, it's very important to him. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if you're right. Yes, yes you're right. Well done. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. Uh, Yaskir, Dandelion, Julian, Alfred, Pankratz. I mean, call him what you want and say what you will. But I do think we can all agree that the bard always looks like a million bucks. And he isn't the only one. Philip, um, I hear you guys are making sure that the uh, Witcher 3 is looking equally suave and sleek on all next-gen hardware. Oh, do I get to announce that? Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. yeah, so if I can say, yes, uh, we are working on a next-gen update for the next-gen consoles to make The Witcher Wild Hunt look extra smooth and extra great again. Of course, for people who already own the game and of course also on PC, we'll be able to upgrade for free. So I'm also really happy to say that for this upgrade, we collaborated with Netflix for some free DLC to add to the game. So as an example, you might be able to wear Geralt's armor, you know, inspired by the Netflix series. And we'll have more info about that in the future. Is it me or does Geralt look a little bit moodier? <laughs> a little bit moodier in that one. <laughs> but I'm very excited as an excuse to play it all over again. Well, um, he's standing so in fire, so yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah that, will, that will always do that it. That will do it. I mean, yeah, you're going to have a bit of a frown. Absolutely. So, seeing as we've got at least one illustrator here in the studio, I thought it'd be kind of fun to play a round of Pictionary. So yeah, the pencils are coming out and basically all bets are off, guys. So Lauren and Declan, I'll be giving each of you a card with a word or phrase on it, and it's going to be the same word or phrase. Now, it's your job to draw it to the best of your abilities within 60 seconds. 
Now, while you're drawing, your partners on the line are basically going to start guessing, and the first to guess right wins. Okay. Sounds pretty clear. Okay. okay. So, we both teams, this. please turn over your cards. Take it all in. Okay. The timer starts in three, two, one, go. Okay, we've got 60 seconds on the clock. And remember, oh, guys in Poland, Borja yes, and no Philip, let us know as soon as you know. <laughs> okay, I'm going to okay. draw my finger because it's yeah? not working. Okay. I think, I, I think, I think I'm seeing a ghost. I'm skull face. I'm seeing a noon wraith. I might be seeing. Has a big uh, fin a on the back. It's like mm. a. Oh. No, it's an arm. Sorry, it's an arm. The other one is cool. Uh, I see. I see a cow with teeth. <laughs> That's how he said it's gone. It's totally a monster. Like, so far, it has like four. It has four limbs, but it looks like very spider. Mm. Come on, guys! Have you got any idea what it is? It's... Shout out if you know. No, it's a ghoul. It's a ghoul, right? It's like it's very spindly, the face. Oh, you got it. Stop, stop, oh. stop, stop, stop. Yes, you are right. It it's a ghoul. Good. It might it has to be. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's just life. It. Like, that's uncanny. My drawing to that. Yeah, yeah, but, it was a pretty good. Uh, yeah. So, with the final point going to the red team, that tallies up to a final outcome of four points to the blue team and five points to the red team. Declan's team is the winner. <laughs> the only thing is, I think. <laughs> It's on me, having said, said I'd play dirty, to play honest, because we wouldn't have got that point without your, your team's assist. So I think, Aww. in fairness, it is the blue team who wins. We helped. Oh, wow. Exactly, yeah. So I think we should yeah, present a little, a, just a tiny little token of, of a prize. Just what? a wee little thing you can put in what? your pocket. What is happening? It's, uh, there was a prize. No one told me there was a prize. I would have actually got, actually, no, I wouldn't have been able to answer the prize. questions. I don't know why. I'm just curious what the prize is. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> okay. okay. You got are, that are you going us? to ship this? <laughs> okay. to us? This is living in right beside Lawrence Pool. Blue team, wow. I present to you, Sir Gwyneth of Gryffindor. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I can't believe you did this for us. That's okay it's because so amazing. I get a consolation Thank you. prize. Thank you. Thank what? You. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, how do you feel, the uh, Wajay? Oh, wait, well, you can't just keep. Well, uh, I mean, I hope you shipped this to taking, Poland, right? I'm so I can, back I can the subway put it in with front me. of my house. We're going to share custody of this, I think. We can, <laughs> um, we can just take turns. You're going to yeah, yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. I get half a year, you get half a year. And, Perfect. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you, you, have a pool, you have a pool, right? I have a pool. I was going to so say. So it floats, right? Is, is it polystyrene? Sure, it does. So, you know, put the kids on that. They'll love it. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you have over there? Oh, yeah, I'm Philippe, do you... I think I have a nice little halberd. Okay. <laughs> it's good for shaving. <laughs> oh, so that, that's our I mean, prize? how do you guys in Poland like feel it. about that? I mean, Philippe, like, are you, are you sad that he just gave away your giant skull prize? I mean, I'll be honest, like a halberd like that is much more useful in the day, you know, day to day business. So Absolutely. I'm happy with that. They both work for home defense. You walk in the door, you see the halberd, you turn around, you leave. But you walk in and you see a giant that griffin ahead and you say, who the hell slayed that? And I'm not messing with him. That's, that's true. Yeah. That's cheaper than paying for those I, I, alarm I'd unit things. I'd much rather have this call. <laughs> yes, agreed. I think the prize is laid out exactly as they should have. Okay, so <laughs> yes. we'll swap weekends and weeks, all right? We'll just post it back and forth. Every and third Wednesday Sounds or whatever. Perfect. Okay, Lovely. well, look, Blue Team, it's my supreme pleasure to, you know, very unofficially pronounce you Wichicon 2021 Law Masters. So, I mean, do you want to share like a few words of victory with your fans or any potential, you know, future usurpers to your crowd? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no words of victory. It's just been so exciting to be here and doing this today. And I've loved working with the team from CDPR on this too. It's been great to partner up and actually, you know, maybe mm -hmm. someday we can end up in the same place at the same time. That would be exciting too. Yeah, yeah, Which who knows? Exactly. Yeah. All four of us, the skull and the halberd. <laughs> right. <laughs> that sounds like a party yeah. I want to go to. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Some little yeah, barbarian mimic owls. Yes, it's a date. You know, WitcherCon 2022, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. do it. Yeah. With fans. Yeah, that sounds With good. With lots and lots of fans. Yep. Definitely. Um, so I do actually have one final question for you guys, uh, for our law masters here. And uh, there's no points to be earned. You know, your, your win is safe here. Um, but you could unlock a secret reveal for the audience if you get this one right. Okay, so um, we talked a little bit before about Geralt's ghoul bite earlier. And uh, after that incident, Geralt was taken to safety by Jurga. But, you know, the White Wolf isn't really having it. Um, he asked Jurga to take him to the Blue Mountains, saying, he'll save me. Who is Geralt talking about here? Come on. It's got to be daddy pants, right? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, 
I wrote the line, so it's kind of unfair for me to answer <laughs> okay, it. <good. laughs> I mean, you know, if Geralt has like one guy who he's always looking out for, it's usually Uncle Vesemir. Yeah, okay, yeah. it's Vesemir. You are absolutely right. The answer is Vesemir. So well done, well done. Um, but also, I have to say, Lauren, I did hear kind of like some sort of mutterings backstage that this sort of might be the year of Vesemir. So can you explain to me why, to be fair, I shouldn't really believe he's dropping, but why is, it the, why is it the year of Vesemir? <laughs> I was going to say, we cannot keep anything secret, can we? No. So, you know, I've spoken a lot about Vesemir. I'm really excited to introduce him in, in season two and to finally meet this man who basically created Geralt, who shaped Geralt into the Witcher that we know and love. Um, but it's a little bit more than that, actually, because even before Witcher 2 is launched, we are launching our first anime feature, uh, Nightmare of the Wolf. And we are so excited for audiences to see this. Wow. That looks incredible. That is pretty exciting. That is very exciting. Oh my goodness, wow. And if you notice, oh. there's, a, there's a date on this, so you're not gonna have to wait very long. Is that really soon? It's that kind of time. I'm really sorry to say, but it is basically the end of panel two. So I'd like to thank Waji and Philippe uh, for joining us from Poland. And of course, to thank Declan you. and Lauren. You. And you guys at home, I mean, did you, did you beat the probes? Did you get more questions right than they did? Well, we'll find out soon enough, but um, I do hope that you stay tuned because if you've enjoyed what's been revealed so far, you do not want to miss the next reveal that's coming right up. me there's no such thing as too much behind the scenes content so I feel like we should keep the good times rolling so um what have you got up your sleeves for us Lauren well I am so excited to take you to a place that I think all fans are dying to see it's a key spot at the core of the Witcher universe join me on a tour of Karamorin that touches upon the keeps lore and visual style across 3d and 2d and live action formats from the games the series and the anime film Come on inside. Creating Kermorin for season two has been quite the adventure. We have worked so hard to bring this ancient keep to life, the place where witchers return each winter to rest and restore. I'm excited to welcome you all, legacy fans and new audiences alike, home to Kermorin. Over 1,000 years old, this building has seen more than its fair share of danger. Each column and stone tells the story of how witchers endured amid the dark history of an evolving continent. The Kaer Morin scene in the video game is in the prologue of the first Witcher game, where players must defend the stronghold from the attack of Azar Javid and the Magister. In Witcher 3, the dreaded Wild Hunt attacks and lays siege to Kaer Morin in an attempt to kidnap Ciri. Players are also able to explore the keep's surrounding regions and dig deeper into Witcher history. In the last few years, the Witcher universe has expanded rapidly, and with it, our understanding of Kaer Morin. The upcoming anime film, Nightmare of the Wolf, will provide our first piece of connective tissue between the past and the present. In the anime, we'll witness the pivotal sacking of Kaer Morin, when fearful, fanatical humans attacked the Keep. And then in season two, we see the resulting dilapidation of this siege. At the very heart of Kaer Morin is the Great Hall, built in stunning detail for season two. We see that the Keep's tables are empty, its giant fire pit casting more shadows than light. At the center of the Great Hall stands the Medallion Tree, a mysterious and looming memorial where the medallions of fallen witchers have been hung for hundreds of years, a reminder of the brotherhood that bonds them, even in death. We also glimpse the Witcher Armory, full of weapons and elixirs to help the witchers defend the continent and themselves against future attacks. And those who know, know. Finally, 
we explore the basement lab, a pivotal place of experiment and research. The lab is also where young witchers are created, if they're lucky enough to survive the trial of the grasses. It's been an exciting journey, crafting a new piece of this witcher world, from the page to the screen. We hope you love it as much as we do. Mimi, what's it been like to be back, you know, amongst kind of all the, the cast? When it's was the last time you saw them? Some of them I haven't seen since early last year. So it's been really beautiful to like blow kisses at them in the distance and air five. Oh, I fully get the vibe that you guys are really, really tight. Yeah, we, we're, our, we're a family. We get really territorial over each other. It's beautiful. It's adorable. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> now, I know I've said it before and I will say it again, but the Witcher universe is, of course, constantly growing. And how's that been for you to kind of see the show evolving in such a way? I am always in awe as to how everyone comes together just to create this for the fans. Um, and I'd actually like to show you something really special. I'm Matt. I'm one of the stunt performers on The Witcher. I'm Dan. Oh, and I'm also a stunt performer. We can't be in the shot, so we need to be greened out. And they use the heads as sort of a reference, how the creature would move and so on. We'll be back at the studio choreographing different fights and that sort of thing, and just go into the set and then green suit up. So obviously this is the, the real deal. Yeah. <laughs> this is us day to day, yeah. we're on set, holding up our green heads. So this is the smallest <laughs> It's took a little bit of a beating over the course of filming. <laughs> like Extremely away. long yeah. pole. And so obviously long. we need to maneuver the head as per the, the choreography. This one. And the other one, his arm everywhere, and he gets, you know, across, the and hmm. it's just absolute chaos. It's what I think the fans want to see. Like right at the end, it just all kicks off, and there's, it's full on. It seems there's always more to learn about the people behind the Witcher universe and the amazing work that they do. Next, we're going to take a look at the Witcher Monster Slayer, a mobile location-based AR game developed and published by the Spocko team. This new adventure in the world of the Witcher will be available shortly, so let's dive in and hear what it's all about from Raphael. Have you ever dreamt of being a Witcher? In our game, The Witcher Monster Slayer, you'll strap on the boots of a professional monster hunter and explore the real world around you. By combining a location-based genre and augmented reality with the visual quality known from The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, we're bringing the monster-infested realm directly into our world. To feel what it's like to be a professional Witcher for yourself, all you need is your phone. But our game is not just about hunting and killing beautifully rendered beasts. Above all, it's the adventures we live that define our experience as a Witcher. And that's what we'd like to share with you today. The Witcher Monster Slayer tells your stories and takes you on adventures in a completely novel way. It will be witchering like you've never seen before. Imagine facing an iconic task that only a witcher can handle. Who are you? Lifting a curse that has turned an innocent child into a bloodthirsty Striga. <laughs> Since when does gold burn? Few have ever succeeded in breaking the spell or killing this particular beast, though many have tried. In the Witcher Monster Slayer, this task will fall to you. Put your bravery to the test and see if you have the power to save the cursed child where so many others have failed. But to rise to this challenge, you'll have to pay attention to the world around you because the game plays out in real time. Like a true witcher, you'll need to prepare, bide your time, and wait until nightfall for the fearsome Striga to appear. And from there, everything is in your hands. Since the worldwide premiere is just around the corner, prepare your phone and be ready for July 21st, 2021. The Witcher Monster Slayer is going to be available for free, both on Android and iOS, 
And you can also pre-register right now on Google Play and grab some cool stuff on release day. The path awaits you. There's plenty to look forward to in the coming months or even years, but there's one topic that we haven't really touched upon during this edition of Witchicon, and that's figurines. So find out next how these collectible pieces were created, what inspired them, and what they really mean to their makers. Hi everyone, I'm Alexandra Jaroszkiewicz from CD Projekt Red, where I'm e-commerce director here at the studio. I'm also responsible for the production of the CD Projekt Red gear line of Witcher World figures. We've been blown away by the love you've shown our Japanese-inspired takes on Geralt and Ciri. Today, I want to talk to you about the creative process behind these designs, which were so rewarding for artists to work on. Folklore and myths like the ones you see in The Witcher often share common themes across the world. Having previously played with this idea, we knew the Witcher's character could work in vastly different settings. Our partners have done some amazing work with figures in the past. They brought the designs of the Witcher to life in such a detailed way, staying very faithful to the style of the games. So, it was enticing for us to step outside the bounds of the dark medieval the Witcher is known for and into a different kind of a dark medieval with Geralt Ronin. You can see that all you know and love about Geralt is right there in full force. He's still a monster slayer, he's still a master swordsman, but we've transported him right into the heart of feudal Japan and really made him feel like an authentic wandering samurai. It was an exciting moment for us seeing the figure take shape. We experimented with the style and spent a lot of time figuring out how to translate the White Wolf's character and the world of The Witcher, so it made sense in this new context and honored it too. When we revealed Ronin Geralt, the feedback from fans was amazing. That gave the art team a lot of confidence to look deeper into this setting inspired by Japan's history, see what other aspects we could explore. We went on to do so with Siri and the Kitsune. We wanted to make Siri look and feel powerful and supreme, but also incredibly elegant. Her stance is tall and proud, very confident and her traditional bright yellow yukata emphasizes that as well. And like Geralt, the character of Ciri is similar to what we know from the games, but this setting gives her a different essence. By taking Ciri and building this Japanese scene around her, it also feels like it adds to her mythology too. After all, she's the lady of space and time. I think she was the perfect follow-up to our first figure. We paid a lot of attention to the individual settings for each figure. We carefully planned the composition and design of each figure's base to help us tell their stories and set the scene. Geralt's is a quiet moment as he hands his way through the Koyasans of Kunoin Cemetery, while Ceres is more destructive, placing her in the ruins of destroyed shrine. We took our time to make the base as detailed as possible, especially when it comes to grounding them in the Japanese culture and mythology. The creatures that accompany each character 
are another way we bring in additional Japanese influences that add to the story of each figure. The Ronin version of Geralt is accompanied by an owl, a friendly Tatarimoke spirit, as he prepares to battle evil Oni demons. Siri, on the other hand, is followed by a wise kitsune fox with five tails. With its yellow, witchery eyes, it acts as a guardian and guide as Siri takes on a dangerous mission to take on a powerful yokai. Working on Geralt and Siri has given us a lot of new ideas for possible stories to capture in these standalone scenes. And now I am happy to share with you our latest addition to our family of figures, Yennefer. We've designed Yen as a kunoichi, a female ninja. The colors and the atmosphere fit her beautifully, and the ninjutsu style connects nicely with her character. When we envision Yennefer in this magical Japanese realm, the ninjutsu aura makes total sense for such a mighty sorceress. It balances a mystic atmosphere with unmatched skill. That's Yen all over. Similarly to Geralt and Siri, Yen is also accompanied by her own creature, a Nekomata. This two-tailed cat acts as a Yennefer's familiar. For a kunoichi of such great poise, power and magical knowledge, this agile little feline friend makes the perfect companion. Like we did with our previous figures, we've put a lot of love into designing this latest era imagining. And we can't wait to show you the final result in not too long. Enjoy the rest of the WitcherCon. Bye! Now there's a person who's found their calling, and you know what? They're not alone. In the next instalment of Humans of the Continent, we'll unveil another one of the invisible forces working passionately to make season two the best it can be. Whenever a cast member who's wearing lenses is scheduled to go on set, I'll be there. My name is Ashwiti Patel, and I'm responsible for dealing with all the contact lenses. The lenses are all supplied by Eye Ink FX, Christina Patterson. She's hand-painted every single one on the show. With the different worlds of the witches, there's been lenses in different worlds as well. So we've got Yennefer with the lenses. Some of the elves have it. And then when characters turn into like creatures, it's been great interacting with the cast members and seeing how all that world's been created. From going from makeup to lenses to actually costume and seeing them all ready to go and acting on set. And just that journey, it's great to see that. I've been joined by the very lovely noob, noob. newbie, Paul. How are you enjoying your first Witcher Con? I'm having a great time. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of been throwing you in right at the deep end, right from the get-go, like into a con. Oh, it's, it's all fun. I'm happy to be here. Mm, well, good. You know, and it's been it's been lovely to have you, I have to say. And we've seen some awesome stuff so far. But you know, don't go anywhere. We've got our lovely house band warming us up for the fourth and final panel, Tales from the White Wolf, which is where host Josh Horowitz is going to have a chat with Henry Cavill, one of your fellow Witcher brothers. There. Yes, my yeah? Witcher brother. Yeah. My Witcher brother. Uh, it was an absolute joy to work with him, um, and we shared a lot of the same ideas about what the Witchers were about. Um, so it was nice uh, to get excited about working with him on season two. Did you bond? Well, we we did bond. We did, did bond. bond. There was, you know, during the COVID time, some some elbows going on. Um, but I, I'm I'm just really excited to see what he's going to say about me because I'm sure the excitement was just as high when he found out that Lambert was going to be played by an actor that he didn't know existed. I'm sure and I hope that it'll be equally gushy. <laughs> Why don't we throw it over to the house band? <laughs> I will fall. 
difficult to hold you in a heated embrace You flee, my dream come the morning Your scent buries that lilac sweet To dream of raven locks and twisted stones Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Paul. Well, what would a WitcherCon be without the Witcher himself? He's the man of the hour. He's a super fan who happens to look amazing in a white wig. It's Mr. Henry Cavill. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, how you doing, Josh? It's so good to see you, man. Congratulations on, uh, this is the first WitcherCon. This means you've done something right. Yes, yeah, apparently so. Apparently so. It's does, exciting, very exciting. Does it feel like a, a bit of validation? This, obviously, this property means so much to you. You are a legit fan. But to know that the fans uh, have come out in force and validated this first season and are ready for more uh, just must mean the world to you. Absolutely. It's, you know, when, when you go into a show like this uh, or an IP like this after having played the games and read the books and there's, I love it as much as all of the fans out there. And so I do everything I can to represent Geralt in, in the best way possible. And, and uh, to have something like this happening and, and uh, a second season, it, it's, all, it's all very exciting and very validating. And I'm, I'm just glad that whatever, whatever I'm doing, whatever we're doing is, is entertaining. By the way, uh, thank you for welcoming t me to your super chill uh, house. This is like a very um, welcoming environment. It's exactly what I imagined Henry Cavill's place yeah. to be. This, this, is, this is, well, I just figured if we're gonna do it anyway, I might as well do it in my place. Yeah, I'm glad you're comfortable. I'm, yeah. I'm excited and a little scared at the same time. It's okay, so just don't touch anything. <laughs> okay, yeah. Mostly poisonous. Yeah. I believe it, I believe it. Um, your buddy, your new co-star, Paul, was just uh, gushing about you to a, a degree. Um, talk to me a little bit about, maybe is there any reciprocal gushing you want to get out of the way, first of all, and, and what's it like to welcome new cast members to season two? Is there an initiation at all when you join the Witcher cast? Lambert, Lambert, what a jolly nice chap. Uh, I actually, I really got on well with Paul, um, and I, I hope that I get to work with him a lot more in, in the years to come. Uh, it's initiation ceremonies or anything like that. No, not really. Um, it, it was uh, obviously a slightly off kilter year. Yeah. And so uh, the regular, the regular um, initiations of maybe hanging out in an English pub and having a Sunday roast right. weren't, weren't quite the thing. But we um, obviously, oh, I hope they enjoyed working with me, but I definitely enjoyed working with them. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun hanging out here. <laughs> we were, we were uh, joking before, we were looking at some footage before we got started of how ambitious the production is on this. I mean, the scale mm -hmm. is, is gigantic. It, is that the biggest difference between the production of something like Witcher and other things? You've been on major productions before, but is that the key difference? Just sort of the practical sets, the environments? What would you say are the big differences? Um, <clears throat> I think it's more of a, a genre difference than anything else, because anything of, of scale is, is always scaled in its own way. Yeah. And I mean, whether it be Superman, which is, it's contemporary, but 
it has the other fantastic elements to it, the superhero right. elements, which uh, make things feel gigantic, even though it's just a gigantic green room. Right. It's take, taken months of prep of uh, wire work to get there. And then there's the genre stuff like this, where it's it's all sets and costumes and wigs and hours and makeup, and, and that makes that feel particularly large. But then there's also the Mission Impossibles. Um, sure. And Tom doesn't do anything on a small scale. Right. And Chris McQuarrie sort of does everything. So when he does it, it is, it is magnificent. And it's everything is big in its own way, really. But yeah, with this, with this, it's it's you notice it because you're walking onto a set like this, and that's yeah. in a room filled with other sets like this. Right. And uh, it is extraordinary. It's a fun experience. Warren and, and Paul were also talking earlier about sort of the bond between Geralt and other other Witchers, and how you kind of equated it in in some ways to your own family. <clears throat> dynamics with your brothers. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Is that Was that a useful tool for you, um, applying your own experiences and your own family to even this fantastical world? I think um, when it comes to uh, the Witcher family, if you will, right. uh, it's, it's, the same, it's the same kind of family tag that I would put on not only my actual brothers um, of, of blood, but uh, the people who are my friends who I call brother. And, and uh, it's not something I just throw around. Um, and those people who, who I do call that, they are very, very close to me. They are yeah. akin to a brother. And so that's, that's more so how I would probably um, refer to as the witches because we come from all different walks of life. Right. Uh, we, are, we have our different opinions, our different um, modus operandi, and, and uh, we don't necessarily all agree. And, and because we don't have that, that family thing, which is, you know, you don't choose family. Right. Um, and so there's a lot more, f it, again, this is a, a greater debate, <laughs> uh, but with family, there tends to be a lot more in the way of highs and lows sure. because maybe it's because you always you always imagine family's going to be there. Yes, and, no matter what. And yeah, yeah even, if, even if you do something <laughs> fairly horrific to yeah. one of them. Um, and it's uh, with, with these guys, it's not necessarily like that. Because yes, they are a small guild, if you will, a very small and, and an increasingly smaller group of people. Uh, but it's because they are a unit like that and because they have this shared sense of, of sorrow and loss and the world is changing and, and they are becoming more and more obsolete, uh, that they, they do have a, a kinship there, but not the same way that I may have with my brother Nick, Charlie, Simon, Piers, sure. um, but maybe in the same way I may have with, with someone else like Ben. One of the major themes of the show, maybe the biggest theme, is, is destiny. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but this feels like this was destined to happen for you. You chased this role. This was very important to you. Do you yeah. believe in destiny? Do you believe you were destined to play a role in The Witcher? I have been asked this question a lot, and um, I've definitely debated uh, fate and destiny with my team, and we all have very different opinions. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> one of my theories, and I don't even know if I'm allowed to call it destiny when this is my theory, <laughs> is that everyone has a destiny. It's about achieving one's destiny. One has to uh, unlock certain levels, if you will, before you can uh, enter, use that skill tree, if you, you know, to yes. use a, a, a fantasy uh, gaming term. And that's what I feel destiny is. And so I had to achieve a certain number of things to get this opportunity to right. play Geralt. It makes... wasn't going to happen if I just lay on my sofa eating pizza. You have to meet the moment. You have to rise Absolutely. to, yes. Absolutely. You set yourself up for success and you got there. Yes, in, in a way, yeah. Um, it's, I, I've been very fortunate. I've been given a lot of opportunity and yeah. it's about running with those. And uh, I, with The Witcher, Yes, I pursued it very hard. I was I was very excited about the concept of, of playing Geralt, and and I got the opportunity to do it, and uh, it's it's something I'm I'm thankful for. I mean, you've you've we've talked about this before. You've had this very unique career in that you've played a bunch of the, the biggest icons, literally in the history of pop culture. Yeah, it's getting there. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I just and, need to play Tom Cruise next. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you heard it here first. Tom Cruise <laughs> biopic. <laughs> Does Tom know? Uh, <laughs> um, but this one does. This must stand apart for you because, yes, yeah, there are things like Superman and Sherlock Holmes, and those have meanings to the entire world. But something about this, my sense is that this means something different to you. It, it, did it mean something more when you landed this role versus these other fantastic opportunities? 
Yes, the other opportunities were uh, very important to me. I, I loved Superman before I played Superman. Right. But there's something about uh, that what having had a hobby and a major part of that hobby uh, was playing The Witcher, right. uh, Witcher 3 specific, specifically, and then um, reading books and fantasy and loving that sort of thing, and then finally getting to play one of those characters uh, was, yes, um, it, it does somehow make it more personal. And it makes it something which uh, I, I, I fight longer and harder for, for sure. Talk to me a little bit about growing up, and I, I know this about you, that again, you lived and breathed this stuff, but as a kid, what did fantasy mean to you, and how were you introduced to it? Uh, my dad would uh, read me books, and I have this vivid memory. Uh, I don't remember the words, but I remember lying in bed and hearing his voice read. He had a great reading voice. Mm -hmm. Still does. <laughs> um, Wait, is your and, dad still reading to you at uh, night? Yeah, I, mean, I can't read. <laughs> yeah. I have people who read my scripts right, and I just yeah. repeat the yeah. lines <laughs> on camera. The secret to yeah. every success, yeah. It's, I have one of those little earwigs. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, my dad would uh, read to me and, and he got me into the fantasy genre right. and, and the sci-fi genre and then very much computer games as well. And so reading fantasy has been, that's what I read. Uh, that, those are the books that are, people have all the different kind of books they read when they have time off. And when I have time off, when I have free time, when it's not scripts, it's, it's fantasy books right. and sci-fi books. Did you, as a kid, how were you expressing yourself? Were you drawing or writing? Were you play acting as, as a kid? Um, how did it kind of manifest? I, I don't think I, I drew or wrote. I'm sure my mom would be able to tell you a story otherwise about that. I, I do remember having a, a creative lean where uh, I, there was one time I was reading a, a book about Douglas Bader mm -hmm. and um, I loved the book and I think I was about 11, so practicing for my common entrance exams which gets you into secondary school. And um, there was a question which said, uh, write an essay on uh, this uh, sentence or this picture. And it was a picture of a clown. And so then I said, I then wrote a story about a Spitfire pilot <laughs> who started off as a clown. Sure. <laughs> and so that was very much my, my lean in writing. I, I, would always, I would always be quite creative and, and, and try and write what I wanted to write. But more to your question, um, as I, I did in an art class build a little castle out of clay because I wanted that for my Warhammer miniatures. Um, I was collecting, I think, wood elves at the time, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted that so I could put them on the castle. Of course, it's completely wrong. They don't live in castles; they live in the woods. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it was still something which I I did, and I think that's how I expressed myself. And so it was storytelling and um, verbally and uh, and uh, building castles out of clay. <laughs> You're still doing that and metaphorically cool now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Gaming. You mentioned gaming, which obviously yes. is, a, is a key component of how you entered this world. Um, do you remember when you first played The Witcher Three and what you and what sucked you in? I I actually played The Witcher Two first. Okay. And I was very busy at the time. I read some good reviews, dipped into it, and I was like, okay, I, I can't I can't immerse myself just yet, and so dipped out. I never got back into it. Right. And so Witcher Three, when it came out, I just got stuck in, and and the world building in that. Is so fantastic. Uh, they've 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 set their rules. They've the graphics in there still stand up today. I mean, I've been playing on my thirty ninety, and um, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> people screaming out there who still haven't managed to get one. Um, I and it's the uh, Witcher guys the, cut him some slack. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the Witcher. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I, I think the, the the graphics still stand up, and uh, I that's what I love the most about it was the the immersion in that world. And you could really feel like you could just go do anything. And the detail was extraordinary. The, the characters, the storytelling, the, the nature of, of what everything was, was, was so wonderful. And all from Sapkowski's amazing work. And it was an adaptation, yes, but yeah. a, sort of, a sort of a post-adaptation. Right. It, it's, it's post the books, but right. they're also doing some stuff which kind of happened during the books. And I thought that was a nice way of doing it because they're not, they're not really changing any major rules, but they are, it's more like a, an, an ode to that world. Yeah. And I think they did an amazing job. Well, it's a great example of this series, this IP, as you say, 
um, honoring kind of the medium in every form. The books work as the books, the games work as the games, and yeah. your show works as the show. And they're not literal adaptations of each. They're they're each embracing the form right. they're a part of. Yeah, yeah. It's a very intelligent way to go. Um, so have you played the game since being the Witcher? And is that an odd experience? Um, I, I actually, I, funnily enough, um, not long ago, fired it up again. And just because I wanted to have a look. And um, I don't know if I told you this, it may have been you, uh, but I, I played the game through a couple of times, right. um, both on the second hardest difficulty, Blood and Broken Bones, I think it is, and then Death March, which is the uh, not fun way of playing the game. <laughs> and so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna have some not fun way of playing the game. And, and, and I definitely need to rewarm myself up before I get into that. <laughs> it took me three goes to get past the, um, the ghouls at the beginning. And uh, I was not impressed with myself. So <laughs> I may go back to Blood and Broken Bone and then have a go at it again because I haven't finished the expansions. Right. And it'd be nice to actually go back there and, uh, and play through the expansions. So the, the series is announced that they're developing a series. And what does Henry Cavill, this obsessive lover of gaming and the specific game and this actor do? You, do you immediately call up Team Cavill and be like, let's make this happen? What, what, how, how did it go down? Uh, yeah, I, I called up Team Cavill, I called up my agents and I said, guys, I hear this is happening. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's get on top of this, let's get ahead of this yeah. I, before anyone else jumps at the opportunity. And so they were calling and calling and calling and, and I believe it was at Netflix almost immediately, and <clears throat> they said, look, we haven't even got a showrunner yet. We haven't got anything yet, uh, so come back later. Right. And uh, eventually, Lauren was brought on as showrunner, and so we kept on calling, and then I went to go meet her, and uh, that was our, our, our first meeting. And then uh, I actually didn't get the role. Um, it was a, you know what, sort of, I, I, sort of, it's thank you, but no thanks, and, right. and then, they went through a full casting process. And then I think then they went, oh, actually, let's, let's maybe revisit that. Right. And, and uh, ended up working out in my favor. Wow. So I went from uh, heartbreak to, uh, to, feeling, to feeling quite good about it. I was gonna say, was that must have been crushing at the it time. It was a little crushing, it yeah. was a little crushing, because I actually hadn't read the books until Lauren had mentioned them to me. Yeah. So Lauren introduced me to the books. And I was like, oh my goodness me, I thought the books were like a play off the games because they all had the game cover on. Mm. And so I then went and read them and I thought, these books are absolutely spectacular. I read them all in record time. Wow. And I was literally landing on a, uh, in a plane, landing at one stage. I think it was reading uh, A Shard of Ice. And I didn't want to get out from my seat, even though everyone was moving. And I was like, no, 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 I haven't finished yet. Haven't you, you don't know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so then I, I, it, I got the, the news and I thought, oh, okay, well, it's understandable. Sure. It, it, maybe that's, that's not where they want to go. With it. To have Superman playing your character is, is definitely um, uh, an understandable choice. And so uh, it was a heartbreak, yeah. But then later down the line, the opportunity um, popped up again. When you read for it, when you started to kind of give your um, take on the role, did you know what you wanted to do with Geralt? Did you have an idea of like what it sounded like, what the voice was, mannerisms, physicality, or did that take some time? Physicality and mannerisms take a, take. I find take time yeah. um, because it's it's about living in the skin of the character. And unless you're doing rehearsals all day long, which often isn't the case, um, it's about time on screen and time interacting, and then you find it, and then you find that place where the character sits. Um, within yourself. Uh, Voice-wise, I do remember saying to Lauren, as like, so for the rehearsal with um, Alec and Lauren, and not rehearsal, for the audition, uh, and I said, you know, should, do we need to like, like put a, like a bit of rasp to my voice or anything? Right. They're like, no, no, just your normal voice. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, cool. And like, I, I was like, that's, that's a cool way to go. And uh, did that and obviously got the role. And uh, then I... I found throughout <laughs> shooting, there was one, I think it was episode three, it's actually King Foltest, uh, that scene where I lock everyone out of the room and walk back in. Yeah. I didn't do that intentionally. That happened by accident. And that was after the Christmas break. And then afterwards I was like, oh my God, I just played a whole scene in the wrong voice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I realized that that voice made a lot of things sit better 
when it came to delivery of certain lines and, yeah. and delivery of certain dialogue. And I thought, actually, I, I kind of prefer this. And I know it's, I know it's very similar to Doug Cockle's amazing work. And I, I, that was a, definitely a, a concern of mine. I thought, oh, I don't want to seem like I'm plagiarizing uh, another professional's extraordinary work. And I had a look at it, had a listen to it, and I thought, actually, they are different enough. It's, sure. um, it's clearly inspired by. Uh, but uh, I did my own thing, and then I spoke to Alec, and I spoke to Lauren, and, and they both said, no, no, it's okay, actually. If you want to do that, we can go with that, and we'll, we'll do the rest, we'll redo the rest. We actually ended up reshooting a lot anyway, so right. I, could, I could go back to uh, but do the voice, which felt natural to me. Um, and Is it a tough voice to kind of maintain through production? Or? No, it's not. Okay. Surprisingly, not. It's uh, it sounds like it is. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's about just finding that. I mean, season one, I'm still still trying to find it. Sure. Um, and you can definitely tell when I have. Uh, but in in season two, it's it's not difficult to do at all. It's actually quite easy. What about <laughs> what about the um the moment when I'm sure you went through a lot of iterations of like tweaking the look of making sure it's exactly what everybody wanted it to be. Yeah. Do you remember a specific moment of seeing yourself in the mirror and knowing that you were satisfied, the production was satisfied? Well, we went through <clears throat> a lot uh, and I, I feel like Geralt's look found itself mm. uh, throughout the season. Um, I think it started off in a place uh, which was perhaps uh, the nose was a little too close to the painting. It was mm -hmm. like, yes, it's great. And then releases the world and the world's like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh God, yeah, what is that? That's a good point actually. And, and so I'm glad that happened because mm -hmm. it gave us, it gave me a chance to, to just start to, to, to find it, a step, take a step back from the painting and yeah. go, right, okay. Um, I need to really focus and concentrate here. And not that I wasn't, but I need to get back to big picture. Yep. And uh, Jackie Rathor, who does uh, my, my hair, she's, she's my, my hairstylist, she was in charge of the wig and she spent, she didn't get to build the wig. And so then she kind of adopted it um, and then she worked in it and worked in it. She was taking it home every evening, every evening taking it home. She was dreaming about that darn thing. <laughs> and, and then eventually I think she, she, she crushed it. So yeah. it's, through the season you can tell and you're like, that's where it starts to look really good. And that's after Jackie has had her hands on it for a while. Have you kept a, a wig as a souvenir or is that the last thing you want to see after you're done with production? Um, <laughs> I haven't kept one yet, no, no, because um, they are actually quite valuable. I'm and sure. because Jackie's done so much work on yeah. them that it, I would never want to take one in case I damage it or something or it, you know, someone spills coffee on it. <laughs> it's not a great look. Um, you told me once that you're a details guy. What are the details that you wanted to see in this show as a Witcher fan? What do you take pride in? Uh, it's, <clears throat> for me, the important thing this season was to bring Geralt as close to the books as, as the vision and the plot would allow. And uh, I wanted him to be more verbose, uh, more of an intellectual. Uh, more representative of a, a man who's lived 70 years right. and has a philosophical lean and yeah, can be mopey at times, but is also, he's, he's wise, he's been mm -hmm. around and yep. he's a nice guy, mm -hmm. despite the fact that he has moments of unpleasantness and is very capable of doing extraordinary violence. It's, uh, his, his intentions are, are often, and that's the, the, the tragedy of the character, pure. Right. And, and so I wanted to really reflect that as much as possible. And uh, it's, it's very easy to, um, fall down the line of him being the grumpy snowman and, sure. and, and there's, a, there's a comedy aspect to that and I, I wanted to lean away from that. Oh. I wanted it to be less about, I, I played the season one way deliberately, which was him out in the wilds and, and without the opportunity for vast swathes of dialogue. It's, uh, I thought best be the man who says less because that seems like he's thinking more. Right. And that was the intention with that. But once you get into a scenario with Cirilla, and the witches and his 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 home space yeah. and with those people who already knows then it was of my opinion that I was of the opinion that uh, you had to let him be verbose and be philosophical and and speak more and be intellectual because that's what he is he's he's not just a a big old white-haired brute 
we started out by talking a little bit about just the nature of this, which is WitcherCon, the first WitcherCon and, and, and really celebration of, of this show, this IP and, and the fans. And I'm just curious for you, when the show dropped and the response was and has been as, as positive as it's been, like, were you, were you out there looking at the memes? Were you looking at the responses or was that a dangerous place for you to be? Or was it, I would imagine it would be thrilling to see all that, to see folks interacting with something you've put your heart and soul into. Absolutely, yes. I was out there. I was looking at it all. Um, the memes I found hilarious. I really did. I really enjoy that stuff. Uh, I, I do spend a lot of time um, sneaking around Reddit and, <laughs> and reading all the forums because that uh, just the audience is who this is for. Yep. And I listen to them. And I think it's very important to listen to an audience and see what everyone's saying. So, so even if you didn't nail it the first time, you can start to adjust, you can start to tweak, you can start to, to yeah. sort of uh, caress it into something which is, which is, uh, does honor to the amazing material that Sapkowski created. Yeah. And uh, so I was reading, yeah, positive and negative. And it's, I think it's important to do it. It's really important. Did you guys know that toss a coin to your Witcher was going to become the earworm that it became? Uh, I, I mean, yeah, it was pretty pretty catchy, but <laughs> I I don't think I mean I maybe in in other rooms that were discussing these kind of things are like this is definitely going to be a hit, uh, but when I heard it the first time, I, I was singing it to myself <laughs> when, when I was watching um, all the stuff before doing press and all sorts, and that was one of the things that stuck in my head, and so yeah, I <laughs> I, I I think I probably knew subconsciously, just didn't actively say, this is going to be an earworm, <laughs> for sure. Mark my words. And now it's your ringtone on your phone, which is a choice. It is, it is. And Joey's the background. <laughs> so we know from a quiz uh, earlier in the con um, about all the nicknames for your character. Uh, there are a bunch of them. Um, I'm of the mind that more is more. So I want, I want to propose to you some new nicknames for Geralt. Cannot wait. You can yay or nay them. There's, it, we're friends here. It's all good. Okay. I think it's, we're all good. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I have let's, a boot dagger. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> all right. Let's take a look at a, a photo and I'll give you my take. Um, let's start with the first photo, please. Henry. Big tree guy. Okay. I call this guy the sketchy Silverado. You know what? The sketch. Yes. I mean, it's white hair technically, I suppose, but I mean. No, but there's lots of silver there. There is a lot of silver. I feel like if you go into a bar and say one beer for the sketchy Silverado, you're always going to get a beer. Yeah. Or you'll be led into some crazy like dungeon downstairs right. for special club. <laughs> exactly. it's about but, the special club. <laughs> but this if, if I met if I met if I walked outside of a bar and that guy was standing there, definitely the sketchy Silverado. Yeah. I yeah. might go to a different bar if I saw this guy outside the bar. But yes. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, this I call the bathing brute. Yes. It's accurate. It is accurate. It's um He's definitely bathing. This is a case where <laughs> Less said, the better, I feel like. The audience just wants to probably just take this in for the moment. Yeah, they let them soak like I was. <laughs> uh, let's go to another very literal one. This is, uh, I call this Roach Rider. <laughs> Roach Rider sounds like uh, something from some post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> yeah. Like sort of from, the, yeah, the Atlantic Basin and the Roach Riders. <laughs> <laughs> the Roach Riders took us out. Or it's a, uh, yeah, like an insect repellent company. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe it's too much about Roach and not enough about you. If, now that if, I, think I mean, about if it. someone takes this and they put some kind of, if they, like, in Photoshop, just some big spray cans. <laughs> exactly. That's a new yeah. business opportunity for yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, next one, please. Uh, tall, dark, and growly. <laughs> I would say tall, dark, and slimy. Yeah, that's, that must be a fun day on set. That must be a happy memory. Oh, actually, I mean, I've got a story about that. Please. Um, if we have time. Yeah. It's uh, this day. Cal had um, run out of my trailer and there was uh, these metal stairs outside the trailer um, and they all had uh, holes in them mm -hmm. to obviously so they don't become flooded with rain. Right. Cal got one of his claws stuck in it as he jumped off and all I heard him do was yelp and I thought, oh, he's landed badly on his right. shoulder or something and uh, went up to him and he was looking shamefaced and holding his paw up and he had ripped his claw all the way off apart from a little bit and lots of blood, all sorts. Oh. Uh, we had just been called to set. And I was going, okay, how do we do this? Leah, could you please take him to the vet? And I'll go to set. She said, you gonna be okay? And I was like, yeah, no, no, I'm good, I'm good. Just let's make sure Cal is looked after and, and he's gonna be okay. I get a call um, as I'm getting gooped up. 
<laughs> and uh, Leah says, right. Vet says, should be fine. They're going to remove the nail. And um, they need to put him under. And the vet has just warned and said, look, dog's going under. They may not necessarily wake up. Wow. And so I'm sitting there thinking, I'm never going to see my dog again. Oh my God. And I'm here on set doing this rather than with him. And this was a, a, a particularly rough moment, but it was freezing cold outside, right? Uh, there wasn't really a, a warm tent set up, even though I've been covered in, I think this was yogurt, mostly yogurt <laughs> and something else, and some kind of fruit, I think, and uh, little bits of stuff to make it look like intestines. And uh, I stood in front of the lights outside, and uh, I was like, this is the good warm spot. Right. And I realized I was smoking because it was so cold outside and all the liquid had heated up in my costume. And so I then said, uh, look, we need, to, we need to take advantage of this. I think it was Alex who was shooting this. And, um, and he said, this is amazing. And so you, if you watch it again, you'll actually see smoke coming off me throughout the scene. It's a, uh, yeah. It's, Maybe, it's, so you're Smoky Yogurt, that's your nickname. Sm that's, that's your... Smoky Yogurt, yes. <laughs> and Cal's okay, that most importantly. Cal is fine. As yeah. a new dog owner, that, that story really hit me. That would the story. Yeah. Oh. He died. <laughs> no, don't, don't even joke. <laughs> let's go to the next one. I called, let's, I feel like you have a future in Vegas as the magic man. Oh, yes. It's like, pick a card. Not that card. <laughs> <laughs> the choreography is already there. You yeah. just need some backup dancers. I said four of clubs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the last one I called, this is my name if I were a witcher. Let's just call him Jerry. Good old Jerry. Jerry. He's the guy at the bar. He's always there. Same spot. Jerry. Bit weird. Yeah, <laughs> smells kind of funny. Well, Jerry. That's, oh, it's Jerry. Don't worry about Jerry. I wasn't going weird. I thought yeah. he was cool, but okay. He, I mean, he could be cool. Depends on what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I mean, wrong with smelling funny, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong. That's a PSA for you. Yeah. Okay, we can take that off and continue. Uh, those are some new nicknames for The Witcher. Congratulations. I sir. love it. Thank, those are good nicknames. Um, let's tease a little bit more on, on season two, if we could. Yep. Um, we have a, a bit of a way to go, but, and you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but mm -hmm. can you elaborate a little bit more on Geralt's um, journey? Um, his, uh, his relationship with Ciri, for instance, what are we gonna see? Is that he's a father figure, presumably? Yes, I mean, as I said before, uh, Geralt is, he's a wise man, he's 70 years old, and uh, there was um, some discussions about him, him sort of struggling with everything, and I thought, yeah, I mean, there's definitely gonna be a, a, a different, um, a, this is a, a different turn for him. Yeah. But he's also he's also wise. You know, he's 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 seventy. He's he's probably seen a few children in his time, and you know, out and about in the world, yeah. and knows what they're like. And he's heard stories from people, and, and he's interacted with with people who are far more difficult than maybe Sorella will be. Yeah. And he, uh, yes, I wanted him to be warm. Uh, if not a father figure, then definitely an older brother figure. And it to have this this kind of uh, just a caring nature to him, yep. um, but also tough because he's not going to be super soft. Uh, he himself has lived a very hard life, and she is about to live a very hard life. She's yep. no longer a princess, and so he's not going to be uh, softening her up any further. He's going to be being straight down the line, and that was very important to me. That Geralt had uh, a sense of a sense of humour while also being tough and also being intellectual and wise. And so I, I tried to lean into that as much as possible when it came to the relationship with Siri. Another uh, important relationship uh, with Yaskier. Where are we gonna see? Well, I, can, I can't really say too much about that. Okay. Um, I, I, I will say that I absolutely love working with Joey and Joey is, is very well versed in the, in the books and, and the law and the IP. And so it's always a pleasure sitting on set with him, uh, waxing lyrical. Another one you probably can't say much about, but everyone wants to know, of course, um, there were fireworks in the first season between Yennefer and Geralt. Yes. What can we expect? I, presumably, hopefully, we'll see them, we'll see her again. Again, I, I, can't, I can't talk about much, but uh, people are fans of the IP, uh, in for uh, plenty of surprises. Uh, let's talk about a new, uh, a familiar character, but one we haven't seen yet, uh, Vesemir. Yes, indeed. Are you excited for the fans to finally see this relationship depicted on screen? Absolutely, yes. Uh, Kim and I, we, we, worked, we worked with each other a lot to try and create a, a, a bond between, between the two and, and something that was important and something that was, was genuinely caring. 
and uh, not not so simple, not so basic, not just like ug ug men and and we do this <laughs> and we kill stuff. It was we wanted it to be sensitive and and because uh, I, I I believe that real men are very sensitive. They they are very capable of doing things which can be uh, like violent if possible or, or, or necessary. But at the same time, they are incredibly capable of of love and caring um, uh, amongst men and towards children and family and all sorts. And so we wanted to make sure that that was a core element to their relationship. And it wasn't too driven by any kind of conflict which was being introduced. The big question, obviously, the fans really want to know in season two, is there going to be an earworm as delicious as toss a coin to your Witcher? There is there is something pretty darn good, actually. I mean, Joey's very talented, and there is something pretty darn good, uh, but only time will tell. Um, this is just for the fa- from the fans, not from me. More bathtub scenes, or is Geralt now taking up showers? What's happening with his, ba- <laughs> his bathing routine now? Yeah, Geralt only showers from now on. He, <laughs> he invented the shower <laughs> right. uh, for this very reason. No, uh, uh, actually, um, there, there are people, my, myself personally, um, there's, there's no bathtub scenes, but people will not be disappointed. There's, there's plenty of man flesh to be observed. <laughs> um, one key relationship we haven't talked about, we haven't talked about Roach, season two. Now, I yes. think... You have something, maybe a treat for the audience. Actually, a little peek. Yes, a little little sneak peek at um, at Roach for season two. Oh, I, cool. I will. Well, that's a gorgeous shot. What uh, do you remember? What can you say about this Roach and this shot and this scene? Uh, well, this this is um, this is this is Roach, this is Zeus uh, from uh, the Roach who we all know and love, and uh, it's it's um, yeah. This scene is right in the beginning. And they've actually done a very good job here because it really looks like winter snow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might have been, oh no, it was quite cold that day, but it definitely wasn't snowing that much. Um, but yeah, this is just a beautiful piece of work. I think this was a uh, Romain's work uh, as DOP and he is extraordinary, very talented man. And uh, yeah, this is uh, myself and Cirillo at the beginning of our journey. Had, had, you exp- had you worked a lot with horses prior to Witcher and how have you been? Uh, I've done, Horse work over the years, yes, uh, but for The Witcher, because of the Roach relationship, and I, I didn't know how far they were going to go with it, how much writing was going to be done, but I wanted to be uh, well-versed. And it was about literally getting back in the saddle. It, it had been many, many years. And I, I had the wonderful opportunity of working with the horse masters there and, and uh, in, in Hungary. And... I had an amazing time. I, I was riding six hours a day wow. to begin with. And then when I came on to season two, it was, I was riding, I was getting up at like five in the morning, sometimes four, just to get up and ride before work. So I, use, I was using that as my cardio basically. So doing an hour, hour and a half of riding and, and, and yeah, just getting better and better and better if I could. And uh, yeah, had the great opportunity of working with everyone there. So I was awesome. very fortunate. Awesome. So we, as you would expect, we have some fan questions yes. for you. So I'm going to hit you with these. Some of these uh, you probably can't say much, but we're going to, you know, we're going to see what we can get. Uh, this is the first one's from Melissa on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And she asks, you know, there it is. Uh, how did you approach Geralt's uh, emotional state after the events of season one? How will you losing Yen and Yaskier, but finding Siri at the end affect Geralt in season two? Uh, well... It's, for me, it's always important to draw from the source material. And uh, I, I wanted to try and keep it as close as possible to that. Yes, the loss of, of Yennefer is, is, a, is, a, is a great blow for Geralt. And it's something which he buries deep. Uh, but he's also, as I said, a man of action, uh, a wise man. And so he, I should probably stop saying man, mutant. <laughs> <laughs> and he, his focus is Cirilla. And he has to push his grief down and away and to one side because that's not what this is about anymore. He's lost plenty of people. Yeah. Um, he's lost Witcher brothers, and Yen is particularly um, a an emotional center for him. But he's got a job to do, and he's got to do it. And so it was an underlying thing, but I actually uh, focused more so, Melissa, <laughs> on uh, focus more so on on being there for Cirilla. Uh, Jessica on Facebook wants to know, what is your favorite Witcher book in the series and why? 
My fa- I mean, I haven't read the full series in in a while since uh, since I just before I got the role, mm. actually. Um, but I have read the first three books uh, a number of times, and I think it still stands. And there could be a lot of reasons for this. That Blood of Elves was actually one of my favorite books. Perhaps it's just because we spend so much time with Geralt in different stories in uh, in the first two books, and finally we get um, one continuous uh, time with him. Perhaps it was also the fantasy lover and gamer in me who got to see the background of the witches and got to see where they come came from. That was really really interesting to me, and also to get an insight to Geralt's personal beliefs and where he stands and and uh, when it comes to world politics when it comes to when it comes to the elves and man and and indeed gnomes and dwarves as well uh, what his opinion is and how he educates Cirilla on on these points and so for me blood of elves I thought was a great book I I, I really really enjoyed it and that's one which always stuck with me uh, at Real Ermin on Twitter wants to know what have you learned from the first season of The Witcher that, are, that you are bringing into the second season? Real Ermin. Do you reckon their name is Ermin or that? This is the real Ermin. This the isn't just an, a fake yeah, Ermin. This, this is, is the real one. Yeah. The real Ermin, please stand up. <laughs> exactly. uh, what have you learned from the first season of The Witcher? That you had a lot of time, <laughs> presumably, between the first season to the second season. Um, uh, that wigs take a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Wigs, wigs are important. Yeah. This is gotta, a valuable lesson. Gotta, and uh, yeah, make sure you've got a good wig worker. Yeah, <laughs> always. Jackie, Jackie nailed it. Uh, at Amanda T on Twitter wants to know, will we get to see Geralt uh, use more signs this season? Uh, we will, yes. Uh, it was something which I, and I'm sure everyone else wanted to introduce a bit more, was uh, Geralt's capabilities. Uh, and, and exploring the witches. And, and there, there are definitely some cases where um, discussions were had and uh, another decision was made and there were discussions that had an other opportunities and uh, then uh, indeed a sign was used. Excellent. Uh, Viscount Yask wants to know on Twitter, we have a lot of new characters announced for season two. As a big fan of the original material, which of them are you most excited to see? Um. I don't know if I can actually say there's any one which I'm more excited than the others because there are so many fantastic characters, uh, especially as anyone who loves the games, you really get to explore those characters in different ways. Uh, but Vesemir was always an important one to me. Sure. And uh, that relationship was, was essential. The relationship between Geralt and, and the other witches was something which mattered greatly to me uh, and, and I loved the way I did just just to see the again blood of elves when reading it and seeing their interaction and, and the way they become these wonderful loving uncles to, to Siri was was touching because they are potentially these monstrous beings who right. live in the mountains and actually they are quite soft and lovely and kind before we end this um, I'm hoping on behalf of the audience that maybe you've brought something special for them no. <laughs> Damn, it. Damn it. It's good to see everyone. Thank no. you very much. No, uh, just joking. Uh, we have a special teaser trailer for all of you. So, I'm your destiny? You're much more than that, Cirilla. I need to understand some things. The world is changing. Sentra isn't safe for you anymore. What exactly is Cameron? The home. Finally. Who the hell are you? Sometimes I feel so afraid. Burn the whole world. Facing your fear is not easy, but I am here for you. When I say run, you run. When I say hide, we have to stay. 
you hide. Run! Destiny has said that the world outside these walls is a dangerous place. But you can find power and purpose. Where is she? What if your princess is more than you're barking for? Are you sure you're ready for this? Welcome back. Well, we can't see the audience at home, but on behalf of them, I think they're going something like this. <laughs> I was really hoping you were going to fully commit to that. <laughs> it looks awesome. It looks epic. It's everything you want and more. Uh, congratulations. Uh, December 17th. We have a date. Can't come soon enough. Um, thank you, as always, uh, buddy, for bringing your passion to all your projects, but especially this one that means so much to you and the fans out there. Uh, it's a pleasure, as always, to catch up with you. Thank you. It's been great to see you. And uh, there's something I've been dying to say. Sorry, this is, this is completely... I, I just... Every day on set, on this set, I was grinding my teeth because there was no one who would know the reference that I'm about to give you. And I mean, if, even if you don't get it, there's some cameras here and there are people at home who will get it. Okay. Do you know Warhammer at all, Warhammer 40,000, that kind of stuff, that Not world? Not the, the greatest expert. Okay, so, that, that's yeah. fine, that's fine. There's people at home who are just gone, oh yeah. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> leaning in now, go for it. That chandelier looks like a Blackstone fortress. <laughs> and I know that no one <laughs> <laughs> on set would have got that. And so I, I have I have been biting my tongue about that. So I don't sound like too you're, much of a crazy. You're in person. the right place at Wichita yeah. to yeah. say that. You <laughs> yeah. found your you found your people, my friend. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I mean the, the set design from Andrew Laws is amazing. I love it. And uh, I don't know if that was his inspiration, but that thing looks like a black zone for I love it. Well, as I said, it's all about passion and I love how much you bring to this project and it, it shows in the finished product. Um, thank you again for your time, buddy. Thank you. Let's go back to uh, Julia, who's gonna wrap up this first Witcher Con for all of us. Julia. That was it for our fourth and final panel. I think Josh and Henry could have kept chatting for ages, but you know what? I got the house band eagerly waiting in the wings. But before I hand it over to them one last time, I'd really like to take this opportunity to say thank you to everyone across the world for watching and making WitcherCon 2021 so special. Together, we followed the path and it's led us to some pretty amazing things. You know, we've been on set inside Care More, we picked the brains of the cast, the crew and the developers, but there is still a little bit more. CD Projekt Red invites you to relive the best moments from the biggest Gwent the Witcher card game tournament in its history, World Masters. The rebroadcast starts immediately after our end credits. And you know, just in case you missed some of today's panels or you're hoping to see even more reveals and announcements, we'll be airing WitcherCon once more for those of you in the other hemisphere in just a few hours time. Now it's time for the band to take us away one last time. Goodbye.
When a humble bard graced a ride along with Geralt of Rivia, along came this song. From when the white wolf fought a silver tongued devil, his army of elves at his hooves did they revel. They came after me with masterful deceit, broke down my loot and they kicked in my teeth. While the devil's horns minced our tender meat, and so cried the witcher, he can't be bleed. Toss a coin to your witcher, O oh valley of plenty, O oh valley of plenty, oh. Toss a coin to your witcher, O oh valley of plenty. Toss a coin to your witcher, O oh valley of plenty, O oh valley of plenty, oh. Toss a coin to your witcher, O oh valley of plenty.